call this order the James City County Board of Supervisors business meeting to order on March 23rd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Mr. Stevens, would you call the roll call, please, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Ms. Adler? Here. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. Mr. McLennan? Here. And Mr. Ripple? Here. All present. All right. Next will be our presentations. Our first presentation tonight is the 2020 Historical Preservation Award, and Mark Jacobowski, the Vice President of the Historical Commission, will present that award. Welcome. It's good to see you. Good to see you. It's good to see everybody in our COVID times here. Chairman and members of the Board of Supervisors, my name is Mark Jacobowski and I'm the Vice Chairman of the James City County Historical Commission. We are here today to show thanks and appreciation for the service of John Labanish to the citizens of James City County. You know, they say if you love your work that it really isn't work at all. John loved his work in the 23 years that he spent with Colonial Williamsburg as a historical interpreter and educator and through all of his volunteer endeavors. He loved talking about and teaching history to both adults and children, and particularly to the children. John made history come alive for them, and he told me many times the gratification that he got from their attentiveness and desire to learn. John was a man of faith. He loved his church and the Knights of Columbus. We spent many hours together in the Knights as members and officers of that organization. He loved his work with the James City County Historical Commission and served three terms as chairman and did so much more for the preservation of history in our county. He was instrumental in the relocation and restoration of the Norge Depot and was front and center to cut the ribbon when it was completed in 2013. I consider it an honor to call myself a friend of Mr. Labanish for over 20 years. Those of us who pursue many hours in volunteer service and work outside of our careers as many of you do, must have a great deal of support for our family. And John loved his family and his wife, and his wife Betta. Betta, well, on behalf of James City County, the Board of Supervisors, the Historical Commission, we would like to present the 2020 Historic Preservation Award and our sincere appreciation for John's contribution to historical education to you in John's behalf and to the citizens of James City County and the countless numbers of other lives that he touched. Thank you so very much. You're most welcome. Sure, go, go right ahead. Thank you so much for nominating my late husband, John Labanish, for this incredible award. I am truly honored to receive it on his behalf. John felt very proud and privileged to be a member of the James City County Historical Commission. For the many years that he served, John was dedicated to the Historical Commission's mission statement which is to further the efforts of the county to document, commemorate, preserve, protect, and promote the rich historical heritage of James City County. I am sure that John is smiling down from heaven, very, very appreciative of this award that you have bestowed on him. So thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. It up here if you want. If you want to come up here, you can come right up here. You can come right up here. Oh, okay. 
Corey, do you want to get behind? Yeah, sure. I would do it, yeah. Well, they're going to do it. Vaccinated. I am too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Very well deserved. John did a lot for our community. Thank you very much for letting him be with us as long as he was. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Next will be number two. Proclaiming April 2021 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in James City County. Ms. Finneroot, welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having us here this afternoon um, to talk about um, April being Child Abuse Prevention Month. Um, throughout Virginia, it is recognized in April. And here in James City County, for over 20 years, we have had a coalition made up of James City County partners, um, City of Williamsburg partners, and community partners. Um, that get together to plan activities to build awareness to this important topic. Um, as we all know, preventing child abuse is something that is a community issue so that we can help ensure that all kids grow up in a safe and nurturing environment. So today I'm here to um, bring awareness and I have some members of our coalition um, with us today. Um, Juliet Heishman is um, our chair from Social Services and Christy Prescott from Parks and Recreation and Jenny Bellis from the Police Department. So this year we will be planting pinwheels as we always do. So we're hoping to expand um, our pinwheel gardens um, throughout the area and so those will be planted next week. Um, we have a lot of online virtual activities, um, obviously keeping in the spirit of COVID. Um, so we have some social media campaigns, um, some activities uh, for families because we want to promote some family activities. And so you have a copy of those and they will be promoted um, socially as well. Um, so, and a coloring contest for kids, of course, to participate yeah. in. So at this time, that's my presentation, and I understand, Mr. Heffel, you have a proclamation. I do have a to proclamation read. to read. Any questions before I read the proclamation? Okay. All right, proclamation April 2021 is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Whereas children of the foundation, children are the foundation of a stable and prosperous society, and a prosperity of the county and the nation is built on a foundation of health and child development. And whereas regardless of who they are or the circumstances of their birth, every child should live in a safe, secure, and supported environment free from abuse and neglect. And whereas child abuse is considered to be one of the nation's most serious public health problems with scientific studies documenting the link between abuse and neglect of children and the wide range of medical, emotional, psychological, and behavioral disorders. And whereas during the Child Abuse Prevention Month, James City County are reminded of the courage and strength it takes to raise a child. And whereas creating a community where families have access to the array of support and the resource to address the emotional and psychological or physical health of the children affected com combats the child abuse and whereas James City County remains committed to sustaining safe, nurturing, nurturing and supportive environments for families raising children and whereas affect child abuse, effective child abuse prevention programs succeed because partnership between families, social service agencies, school, faith communities, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community, and whereas James City County strives to engage the community in their continued operations of efforts, child abuse prevention programs, and whereas James City County Department of Social Services, Police Department, Parks and Recs participate in the Child Abuse Prevention Coalition of Greater Williamsburg, along with community partners to increase awareness of child abuse prevention efforts. And whereas displaying a pinwheel during the month of April will serve as a positive reminder that together we can prevent 
child abuse and neglect by doing so keeping children safe. Now therefore be it resolved that I the chairman of the Board of Supervisors of James City County do hereby recognize April 2021 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in James City County. And I call this observation the attention of our citizens to recognize and ensure we have a safe place for our children to strive. In witness, therefore, I undo set my hand and cause the seal of James City County, Virginia to be affixed this 23rd day of March, 2021. Thank you, great job. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but for rabies. <laughs> now. Thank you. All right, number three, boat slash capital trail expansion. Um, presentation. So, Mr. Robert Crone, how you doing, sir? Mr. Chair, if I could do a, a brief yes, introduction sir. just to start off and not just toss Mr. Crum out there all by himself. Um, <laughs> I do want to uh, mention that bicycle and pedestrian facilities have been important to our residents for a long time, and we have a good investment in that. We are fortunate to have some really great facilities within James City County, including the Capitol Trail, that provides a paved off-road bike and pedestrian path for some 50 miles headed towards Richmond. All Hampton Road localities have an interest in our bike and pedestrian facilities or in bike and pedestrian facilities as well. And some years ago, a study was completed that would connect many of our neighbors to the Capitol Trail. This plan was named the Birthplace, Birthplace of American Trail or Boat Trail. Last year, the Peninsula City Managers and County Administrators began discussing this topic and looking to our Planning District Commission for assistance in moving the idea forward on the Peninsula. And I'm pleased to share that I feel there's a lot of good energy behind this concept. And Bob Crum, our Executive Director for the, our Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, is here this afternoon to update the board on what has been discussed, some projects that are expected to move forward, and what we can do to help facilitate maybe our part in this effort. So with that, I turn it over to Mr. Crum. Welcome, Bob. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hipple, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members. It's my honor to be uh, before you today to uh, give you some information and, and what I'm calling a project overview uh, opportunities and update on what we think we can do to bring the Virginia Capitol Trail uh, through James City County and take it down the peninsula to Fort Monroe and really leverage what we think is an incredible asset and opportunity as a potential economic driver and quality of life driver for, for your community. Um, as, as has been mentioned by Mr. Stevens, I'm your executive director of the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission and the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization. I work on your behalf for you to promote regional cooperation and seize regional, regional opportunities on behalf of the 17 local governments in Hampton Roads, both on the peninsula and on the south side. Um, as, as Mr. Stevens said, the, the CAOs last fall uh, reached out to me on, on the peninsula and said, Bob, we really need your help. Let's, let's see if we can charge some energy into this um, idea of the boat capital trail. So really excited to share with you today what, what our vision is. So uh, full disclosure, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to come to Hampton Roads in 2015. Before that, I was in Richmond doing this same work since 2008. So one of my projects was the Capitol Trail. Uh, so, uh, as you all aware, uh, and Mr. Stevens, I believe this is on each board member's screen, correct? Yes, okay, thank you, sir. Um, this is just an incredible trail that really unfolded over about a 20-year period. It starts in downtown Richmond. Uh, you see it starting in downtown Richmond by our um, state's capital. It, it comes down through Rockets Landing, goes down the James River, and really proceeds in an uninterrupted manner, uh, 55 miles, and lands on the doorstep of, of Williamsburg in, in James City County. Uh, just an incredible, incredible trail. Um, 
One of the things I think makes it so special is the care that was taken, and this is a prime example in Charles City County. Um, if you're a biker like me, I don't do well with a whole lot of up and down. Um, so a lot of timber bridges to go over drainage areas, uh, fairly flat, even surface, uh, that really is uh, j just an, an incredible asset uh, that a lot of people uh, take through uh, Charles City County. James City County, you already have a portion of the trail that, that exists that, that I know you're familiar with in James City County and, and is a great resource that, that is utilized. But right now, I, I think how we want to try to position this, if we look at Williamsburg and James City County today, you're at the eastern end of a 52-mile trail. Our vision is to put you in the center of biking for Eastern Virginia. We, we think this is that opportunity. We envision a trail going over 120 miles that you're gonna be right in the middle of. And despite, um, you know, enjoy work with my friends in Charles City County, but let's be honest, if you're biking uh, from, uh, and, and you leave downtown Richmond, you go through Henrico and you go through rural Charles City County, there's not a lot of place to, to leave money, right? Um, that changes your bit of the first destination here, right? Where people can enjoy restaurants. They can perhaps stay a night in the middle of a journey that they're taking. Um, they, they can buy um, equipment for their bicycles, et cetera. Our grand vision is to bring this trail down the peninsula and take it the whole way to Fort Monroe. Newport News is hoping to do a loop off of this main trail, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We also envision eventually taking the ferry over across the river and bringing it down to the south side and then taking the whole way to the ocean front. And I can tell you my colleagues in North Carolina, Northeast North Carolina have told me they have their eye on what we're doing because they'd like to come up through the dismal swamp someday and connect and, and even take it down towards the, the Pamlico Sound. But we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We want to be strategic. We want to get this segment done. So our focus right now is on your peninsula. That, that's our first priority that we really want to try to pursue. So um, this is generally our plan. Um, and, and, and I have to say, when we walk through this, um, at the time, the Virginia Capital F Trail Foundation said that they really didn't have the resources to look at participating and extending. Thus, our trail was called the Birthplace of America Trail. You're going to hear me call it the Boat Slash Capital Trail because they're, they're reconsidering that. They're under new leadership. And we think there might be some synergies for this being part of that century-long trail, that 100-mile uh, trail. So uh, we're, we're going to be working on that for you in terms of marketing and messaging. If you think about this trail, and, you know, and we've been on many of these, but I can't think of another one that has the destinations along it that our trail down the peninsula would have. Um, and, and you're going to know these much better than I, but starting in Jamestown and proceeding uh, past Williamsburg and even past the Yorktown battlefield and through uh, beautiful areas of Newport News and ending down at Hampton and Fort Monroe where the city is planning a loop trail that will serve as the uh, easternmost anchor of your peninsula section of this trail. We just think this could be unparalleled in terms of the history uh, telling that this could uh, interconnect and the population centers it could interconnect. So uh, what we have right now is on the peninsula, again, 52 miles from Richmond down to our region. Uh, right now, we have five miles built on the peninsula. Our job at hand is to, how do we build 77 miles of trail? Right? If we can do that, we would have 82 miles in the peninsula, over 130 miles of interconnected trail extending from Richmond down to Fort Monroe. That, that's our goal and what we see as our opportunity. Now, we already have segments built. Um, here is James City County, Monticello a Avenue. Uh, we have some other areas that are already built in powder blue. York County through, um, I've, I've learned from Neil Morgan, Mr. Stevens, that the McReynolds Athletic Conf Complex is the MAC. Uh, it took me a few meetings to get that figured out. But um, they have a portion of the trail uh, through their um, uh, Met McReynolds Athletic Complex. Um, Newport News um, has a section down on Chesapeake Boulevard. So we have some things to work with. But what we really want to do is identify low-hanging fruit. What can we get done in the next three to four years? 
And what we did is we looked at our long-range transportation plan. And Mr. Eisenhower, I know you and I have already had a lot of conversations <laughs> about those projects. And Mr. Hippel, we worked together for five and a half years on those projects. And the good news is we have candidate projects in that plan that we think we could begin construction of. And I'd like to, I'd like to, and, and, and they require work. We got to get them ready to move, right? But it's something that I think we're on a path to be able to get done. So let's, um, let's start um, first um, in, in Williamsburg. Uh, Williamsburg is going to have to think about how the best way is to get it from where the trail ends now. And, you know, it's going to be very difficult to go right through the center of Williamsburg. So they're working on different ways that, that, that we can do that in a cost-effective manner. But one of the areas that we're really excited about is Carter's Grove Country Road. Um, we're, we're excited because it joins two segments of the trail that are already complete. Um, it's a shared youth path. Um, the right of way by and large is already there. You see a surface there that people unofficially are biking and walking on today. And some portions are owned by Colonial Williamsburg. And we have um, engaged uh, Mr. Cliff Fleet from the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation who is very supportive of working with us on, on this effort. Uh, this portion of the trail has some challenges, right? Uh, we're going to have, and, and it has some segments we're going to have to take a careful look at. But, you know, some portions are already paved. It does need resurfacing. It's just beautiful scenery. I, I'm sure some of you have been through there. Uh, the right of way largely is owned by uh, James City County, Colonial Williamsburg, and Kings Mill uh, Neighborhood Association. We're going to have to collaborate with all of those entities. But we think this could be a tremendous uh, opportunity to really get our trail moving. Um, through this portion of James City County. So I'll come back and talk about more on that, but you know, we're gonna have to take a close look at some of these um, older bridge um, structures through here and just make certain, you know, what, what's it gonna take to make certain they're safe, to what investment will be needed, um, doing, working with the property owners. That's gonna be very, very important. And, and I wanna stress that everything we're talking about, we begin with, we respect private property and respect those property owners. They, they'll, they'll need to be at the table collaborating with us and, and we with them. So, um, so this is a section that we're really excited about. Um, Newport News, I'm going to come back to this because they have a better idea and I want to show you how they think they can build 15 miles of this trail within the next three years. So I'll come back to that in a second. Um, this is the section through the McReynolds Athletic Complex. Um, we have a portion um, that is already built. Um, and then this is the five mile loop proposed down at the end of the trail in Fort Monroe, which will really create an incredible anchor of this um, down by the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. So if you look at the powder blue, the sections that are already built, and you just identify those ones that I already have, we think there's some next build sections here in blue, here through the, and I'm gonna show you an even bigger section of build we think we can do through Newport News. This project is already funded. Um, it's the proposed Pocosin connector on Victory Boulevard that includes bike facilities and sidewalk facilities. So this is funded and we're gonna have this done in the next two to three years. So that portion will be built. So we think that is a really exciting connector uh, to Pocosin. I can tell you that through the MAC, um, Yorktown, uh, York County is really interested in extending down to Yorktown so that that trail could go down to the waterfront, which we think would be an incredible asset. So the big question is, what would it cost? I, I think that's always the first question. So our estimate, if we look at an average per mile cost, is about $125 million to build that segment um, on the peninsula, okay, to take it from uh, just west of Williamsburg and take it the whole way down to Fort Monroe. We think, though, that there's some funding approaches we can begin to explore for you. First is smart scale. The state smart scale program, they're really interested in funding more than uh, roads and streets and, and interchanges. They're really looking for walking and biking projects. So we think that could be a really um, exciting opportunity. We can work with our Commonwealth Transportation Board members. Our CTB members get about one to two million dollars a year that they can use for different types of walking and biking trails. We are 
working with our federal delegation. This morning we were on the phone with um, Congressman uh, McEachin's office. Um, yesterday was with Congressman Whitman's office. Earlier in the week was Senator Warner and Senator Kane. We're about to speak to Representative um, Luria's office. And when we do, we let them know that if there's gonna be a federal infrastructure package, there's two things that are must-haves for our region. Number one is we gotta complete I-64 from your county to Richmond, the gap. We gotta get that done. And secondly, boy, would there be a nice federal investment in this Capitol Trail extension uh, down the peninsula as well. Um, I know Mr. Stevens had said that there may be some things that he and neighboring localities could do in your capital improvement program. If we can get a good uh, trail uh, path recommended, we believe perhaps that puts us in a better position to collaborate with developers. If they want to volunteer their open space set aside to help towards us, that's an opportunity. And my board also um, has certain uh, monies, RSTP and CMAC, and uh, Mr. Holtz in the back and works with us very closely of lining your projects up for that. So we think there's some regional money we could bring to this as well. But we've made, um, we made some really exciting progress. And I, I have to tell you, I, I really have to credit Virginia Department of Transportation and Chris Hall, the district administrator. So I'm working with your CAOs. We've been in probably uh, five meetings on this. And I went to um, Chris Hall at VDOT, your district administrator, and said, you know, what, what help could you bring to this? And um, this is what Mr. Hall's committed to from VDOT. So VDOT is committed to bring us an on-call consultant. Michael Baker International is gonna be assigned to this project through the statewide contract at no cost to us. In addition, the state's gonna bring $200,000 to support Michael Baker's work. And what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll take a look at these next build segments and gonna let us know what the cost would be, what we need to do to make it safe, make it efficient, deal with right away issues, et cetera, and get these segments so they can be grant application ready, right? We gotta get them matured enough that we can make them smart scale applications. They're also gonna assign us a project manager from VDOT and give us access to the VDOT project manager that worked on the Virginia Capitol Trail. So those are all things that we're really excited about. So our goal is gonna to be to get these project segments ready to go for grant applications and refine the route locations. And if I could, could I, um, could we um, just hit escape on that? And I, I, I wanna show you by what we mean in terms of, um, and I'll move quick on this, but I wanted to show you what um, Newport News is doing. So Newport News has already taken a look at their segment and what they've done for us is they've identified routing that is primarily on city of Newport News property that would be 15 miles of trail that if we could get them funding, they believe they could build in three years. Um, this would be right in the center of this trail. And we think it could really kickstart this. Um, so, you know, the opportunity here, and they, they've got it broken down, and, and, and you can just get an idea to come down through the MAC here. They have some circles of places that our consultant will need to take a close look at. But, um, you know, they have the segments broken down in cost estimates. Uh, one segment here is about 4.5. Uh, the other is, um, you know, 2.5. So this segment's about $7 million to build. Um, and they've done that for each segment. Um, so to be able to take, um, oh, and if I may real quick, um, and it's the, the things you don't learn through these type of studies. So this trail comes down through this radio control air club, uh, airplane club. That what we found that we didn't know is that there's a tunnel under Denby that we didn't know about. <laughs> um, and um, it will need some things done in terms of illumination, et cetera, but what a great place to be able to work with to extend that trail through. So um, we're really excited the type of work Newport News there, and that's the type of work that, that we'll be doing in other localities. So um, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to um, come and give you all with um, Mr. Stevens' request an update. Um, I'm here to answer any questions, but just to assure you that um, this is on our regional radar, and we're going to do everything we can to work with you to, to move progress on this. So, Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any questions for Mr. Crum? Well, I don't know that I so much have a question as I think this would be great. Um, I know I'm very fortunate in that a, a large portion of that trail is in the Berkeley District, 
but I see friends from Richmond all the time that will come down here, go to Billsburg, grab a beer, go back. Um, and so I think the more that we can get, and, and I do have to say to our friends in Charles City, I, I think there is a restaurant there. I don't want them to get mad at us. Um, but any way to increase that and to make it a longer trail just, I think, has got tourism written all over it. I'm wondering if you've done any return on investment studies um, yet. So you say it's $125 million. Do you know what kind of money would come back into the localities? That, that's, a great, that's a great question. We don't have a good number yet, okay. uh, ma'am. I, um, I, I do think that that's something we're going to continue to monitor. Part of the challenge that we have is trying to, and because Charles City County is so rural, it's hard to really get an idea of that. But we are going to look at some other communities to see if we can't provide you some estimations. Okay. I think if we can complete this, uh, what's so exciting, I think, about James City County and Williamsburg is this is about halfway and would just be an incredible place where people could look to spend the night. Um, I, I could see tourism packages where people could start biking and maybe at Fort Monroe they get the bus back, right, with their bicycle. But I think there's great opportunity, and I, I appreciate your comments. But I'll, I'll see what we can put together on that ROI estimate for you. That'd be great. Yeah, so I have two neighbors that are now biking from California wow. to here, back home. And they ran into people yesterday that are on their same trail. They're also biking to the East Coast. So there is a huge... Um, bicycling is just is very popular and a, and a great people feel it's a great way to see the country so thank you I can I'll, I'll second uh, the the notion that uh, this is a, a great idea I'm glad to see a, a good portion of it would be the country road um, uh, that uh, uh, would really be a very nice addition to it um, I I guess I'd wonder about um, how committed you are to the naming of this particular um, uh, facility, um, just because as I first started hearing about this and before the presentation was loaded, I kept seeing boat and wondering if this was going to be some kind of maritime trail. Uh, and uh, um, hopefully, uh, one of the things that we're um, hopeful for is that there will be an identifiable kind of um, branding consistently uh, across our tourism community. Um, and that maybe there's an opportunity there to think about uh, something that's uh, um, sort of more um, in sync with uh, uh, what this this trail will be about and what our community is like. A absolutely, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, yes, I, I agree. We are not tied into the boat trail. Um, one of the things I failed to mention is we have the RVA 757 Hampton Roads Mega Region Group behind us on this. And they've actually lent us some expertise to help us with messaging and branding. So we'll be coming back to you with some ideas because I think um, the, the thought is that when you think of philanthropic um, interest and investment in this trail, which we think there could be, we think there could be businesses or health foundations that might be interested. It appears that we think they'll be more inspired by investing in something 135 miles long than something that's the cap trail and then the boat trail. So we're going to work on that messaging and, and come back with some ideas for sure. And I think too that um, you know birthplace of America trail boat. You know once you if you if you put it out there right, it's just like in Williamsburg, Duke Gloss Street is dog. You know so you know, everybody knows Dog Street and. But if you're not from around here, you wouldn't know. You would think, okay, so where you walk your dogs, or what is that? And, but all of us know, you know, Dog Street is Duke Gloucester, and um, so maybe the same thing. You kind of wrap that, you know, same way they did, you know, and it's just kind of kind of named by the locals here. Everybody knows go to Dog Street, and they know they're talking about Duke Gloucester. But you know, that could be put out as far as, you know, boat, and you know, because I told a couple of, <clears throat> excuse me, the. Um, Clients that I'm working for right now, build a house for they they are big bikers, and they they've taken the trail because I was talking about this presentation and and want to get this to them because they're very excited about the further they can ride the better 
and they'll leave from Newper News and they'll come up to hop on the trail and then they'll ride all the way up to Richmond, spend the night and then come back and then make a, you know, a night of it up in Richmond. So it'd be nice to make a night of it here in town <laughs> and get them coming down this way. So great idea. Thank you. Any other questions? Bob, thank you so much for hey, spending time with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right, next is our VDOT quarterly report. Mr. Rossi, welcome, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Hipple, other distinguished members of the board. Um, here to give the quarterly report for VDOT. Uh, this quarter is from December 1 to February 28th. Uh, in that quarter, we completed uh, 636 work orders out of 734. Um, which is an 87% completion rate. The ones remaining uh, were 71 of them were drainage, uh, 24 roadway issues, and three vegetation. Uh, our main focus uh, currently is on drainage. Uh, we do have a backlog of drainage work orders. Uh, just because it's been such a wet uh, season or year, I might as well say a wet year. Um, but we're continuing to um, work towards those improvements. Uh, a big focus of ours has been pothole patching, pavement patching, uh, getting the uh, sections of road that are in the upcoming plant mix schedule um, patched out so they're ready to go when we're getting ready this summer to uh, pave them. And then we've had some sweeping contract in our VDOT forces doing some sweeping. Um, hopefully we're out of the snow season. Um, so we can go through and uh, try to get up all those abrasives and sand and silt before it gets into our drainage system. So uh, that's that's a big focus of ours as well. Uh, drop inlet repairs, we, we did 89 uh, drop inlet cleaning, cleaning um, in that quarter. Uh, we did get 34 lane miles swept uh, in that quarter. Uh, we completed two miles of ditching. Um, we patched roadway surfaces and uh, in February, we did the first uh, primary route litter pickup in the county, and we're doing the secondary route this end of this month. Um, so we'll have at least those two done before we start into our first cycle primary mowing, uh, which is in April. Um, some of the current projects, I-64 widening segment three. Um, if you've been out there, you've seen some lane shifts and working on the other side, uh, working on the bridges. Um, it's going well. Um, still scheduled to complete uh, at the end of this year. Um, so hopefully that project will uh, get some, some dry weather <laughs> and be able to get some work done. Um, you know, the bridges are the risk out there on that project. Um, so. We'll continue to work fast to try to get those complete. Uh, the Long Hill Widening Project, that's certainly uh, been under construction for a bit now. They have moved into phase two, which is from the roundabout out towards Old Town. Um, we, uh, we're doing addition to the right turn lane on Old Town Road, and we have landscaping and uh, sod, um, and that completion will be fall of this year. Part of uh, that same project, but it's a separate project because the revenue share project, we have the uh, Old Town Road um, turn lane extension um, at Long Hill Road. That project is going to be uh, completed or done this spring, summer, as part of the Long Hill Road project. So that all happened at the same time during the same, by the same contractor. Uh, the Skiss Creek Connector, uh, that's a design build uh, project that was smart scale funded. Um, that is per se under construction, under design. Uh, we're looking at uh, April uh, next month that they'll start doing turning dirt uh, at 143 and 60. And then to follow up, they'll start the route between the two. And there are two bridges also in that project um, that they will be. Uh, constructing the one over the railroad and and 143 and, and the one over the creek um, and that um, 
that's all for the projects that we got going on right now. The plant mix um, for the James City County uh, bids open tomorrow. So we have advertised it, bids open tomorrow. Uh, I have a list of roads here. I can go through them, but there's a pretty, pretty good list of roads, a lot more than we got last year in the county um, that will be paved, a lot of primary roads, Route 5, 143, 199, Monticello, uh, the secondary section of Monticello, Route 5000, um, Centerville, um, section where we left off at Centerville Road through the project we just completed at News in Centerville. So there's a bad section just past where we completed that project. That'll be paved as well. Um, Neckerland Road, the Colony, uh, Lake Powell Road uh, on this side, on the, on the 31 side, uh, Druids Hill and the Elmwood subdivisions. Uh, we also are happy to say we have a on-call pipe uh, rehabilitation project that uh, that has been awarded and notice proceed and they will start their work in uh, next month and will be working through June um, to replace or uh, rehab uh, pipes that we've had uh, sitting in our system that we're trying to get to for a long time. Um, it's about a little over a half a million dollars worth of work, and there's 12 sites in that project. So uh, we are tickled to get that uh, moving, and some of those um, projects off of our list um, that we've been trying to find funding for and, and means. Um, some upcoming projects, um, we have the Croker Road four-lane widening uh, from the library to Route 60. Um, that's gonna widen the two-lane to four lanes, um, from Route 60 to uh, Point of Woods Road. Uh, that is projected to start um, late 2023, so just a couple years out. Um, I will, there's a couple projects that we have in-house, um, and that is Virginia, we're talking about the Virginia Capitol Trail. We're going to be replacing the deck and substructure for the wooden bridge at Jamestown next month. So that section from Green Springs to Jamestown will be closed. Um, we are trying a uh, sort of a pilot and utilizing a uh, friction coating on the decking boards. It's an epoxy. The, uh, the one risk that we have with this project is we have to get the timber uh, moisture level to 12% and falling. Right now we're at 18 percent. Um, we do have them in a drying room. We do have them separated. We're trying to accomplish that uh, moisture level, but I think it'll be a uh, a safety. Uh, one, we'll have a, a rehabilitated bridge, but also it'll be some safety involved with that because there's in those uh, wet, damp, low light areas on the trail, uh, the wood structures seem to to develop a, a film when they're wet. And this, this should, uh, one, keep that algae or that film from um, sticking to the wood, and also it provides a friction coating, uh, so it increases the friction uh, for bicyclists and stuff of that nature. If it works well, um, our intentions are to do the long bridge, um, the one back side, side Green Springs, um, after this summer, so fall of all the same year. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just so I'm clear, yeah. um, there's the bridge that runs behind the neighborhood, so like behind Fieldcrest. Behind, that's the long bridge, yeah. That's the long one. Mm -hmm. So you're p replacing the Beaver Dam Bridge? Yes, the one that the one that parallels Route 5 from okay. the high school. We're going to start this shorter bridge. We're going to okay. start with that first. They, this is a pilot program. Okay. Um, so just gonna, because I just sent something to Jason today, there were some pretty rotten boards on the Long Bridge. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we've been switching out planks about every month. Okay. Um, I think the last time we were out there, I think we did 19. Um, but you are right, it is very slick. It is, uh, it in, is. In, in, and that's why I'm, I'm really hopeful that this solves that issue. Okay. Um, and like I said, this is going to be our pilot. We'll see how it works out. We're going to coat the deck uh, boards before we go out to do the installation. Um, 
hopefully to minimize the impacts. The, the is this like uh, the uh, the deck over paint with the grit in it, uh, which was like a, a sealer for the? Uh, I've seen a, that lot like it, a lot like it. A lot like it. Um, it is a. Uh, we did sort of a neutral color. Uh, I think we we everybody kind of looked at the color and picked. Went through the Virginia Capital Trail Foundation. Kind of did that, but it's it's an epoxy. Um, it does have um, like a sand type mixture exactly. in it. What's your um, estimated lifespan on, on doing that? You had, well, you we're hoping um, the existing bridge, <laughs> we've probably um, replaced every plank that's on it already over the past, what, 20 years? Um, however, we being that it's sealed and we are using the finest grade treasure breeded Tum I mean, we're, we're using better timbers in the replacement than was spec'd when they built it. Um, so we're, we're thinking 25 plus. Okay. Um, you know, this it's is what we're hoping. Um, but the ones that are out there now are, are less grade. You know, the great lumber comes in many different grades. Um, this, is, this is what we should have built it with originally. And you said next week. You would do when, when are you closing that bridge? Late April is late what April, we're, I'm sorry. we're shooting for late April. Okay. Um, as but I said there's a risk involved with the moisture level sure. of the timber that we have. So you're at eighteen and you need to We're be at eighteen, I need to be at twelve and okay. fall in. So thank um, you. That's that's what we are. If it if it shifts a couple weeks, it's you know why I'm shifting it, it's because we did not get the moisture level. But all the materials, the the on call is ready to go. Um, that's the only thing that we're waiting on. Yeah. Um, another project this spring is going to be the uh, striping, the edge line striping on Route 5 between, I think it's Brick Bat and Chickahominy. We're going to eradicate the edge lines and put in what is called um, rumble markings. Now, you know, like on 199, we have cut grooves in the pavement um, to try. So if you run off the road, you get that vibration. This said, and we're not going to cut the pavement here. This is actually the yellow, the um, the white edge line has some skips in it um, that you can feel when you when you hit the line. You can feel that um, it's not as abrasive as you know the cut rumble strips, but it gives a little more. Um, you know, it's not a lot of shoulder on that road to start with. You have the Virginia Capital Trail on one side of it, um, and it's trying to reduce. Um, fixed object crashes, people running off the road, hitting fixed object. Plus with the trail being on the side of, of that section, um, it also helps identify if you're getting ready to run off the road, um, you get some sort of warning. Um, sidewalk and bikeways on Route 60 from Croker to Old Church Road. That's uh, another pedestrian bike project that we're doing in the county. It's approximately uh, 0.4 miles of sidewalk and bike lanes uh, to increase pedestrian and bikeway connectivity. Uh, the project is being coordinated with the Croker widening, um, which will be from Richmond out to the library. And um, that is online, to, I mean, um, scheduled for construction to start in 2024. I'm sorry, 20, late 2022. Uh, they are in the right-of-way phase now. Then we have Smart Scale 20, which is a Long Hill Road shared use path, another pedestrian project in the county. And that's pretty much connecting the pedestrian, um, the, the shared use path for the Long Hill widening project across 199 and connecting over on Depew side, uh, kind of going towards the rec center into the city of Williamsburg. That, that, that's already in, in place, like if you're going to uh, Palmeo Park. Um, so to connect all that so you can go all the way from uh, through that project all the way in to Ironbound Road. Is, is that um, the way that trail now is going to run? It's going to come up from 7-Eleven to Lane Place. Is it supposed to cross over and go on over across 199 on the, on the, the right-hand bridge as you're headed back in? That's right. Okay, and then once it gets across... Somewhere down there around the pew, it has to cross back over to connect to 
the uh, other trails that go by. Right. There's, the well, actually, there's sidewalk. I think it connects to a sidewalk to okay. start with, right. and then it then it opens up the trail like you go into the rec center. There just wasn't space to do it on the left-hand side, I, I guess, coming coming toward the rec center. As, as it's a tough to. project um, yeah. with the bridge and um, with the uh, – with the limited shoulder um, yeah. on that side as well, it's yeah, the, the, you would the, think the that retain, it's not wall much and to it. Very but narrow, but I would. It I is very it. narrow, so there's going to be some widening there. There's going to be. Uh, it has its challenges. It does, um, and it's got to be a separated path, pretty much from the through lanes on Long Hill um, as you go over the bridge. So um, we have our best on it. <laughs> uh, some county safety and operational projects uh, we did that we've completed. We installed the pedestrian crossing um, on Route 615 Ironbound Road there at Veterans Park. Uh, that was completed March 17th. Um, we have two county safety and operational projects that we are scheduled to start Thursday morning, uh, and that is the Route 5 um, right in, right out at Centerville Road. And then the Route 30 at Old Stage, the Old Stage right out only on the Rochambeau. Um, they will be starting at Route 5 in Centerville Thursday morning. Uh, if we cannot complete that one and the other one in a day, they will be at 30 the following day. So it's a either a Thursday project or a Thursday Friday project. Depends upon how how um, how smoothly things go. Uh, also, as part of that project, it is a speed reduction uh, through that intersection of Green Springs and Centerville Road on Route 5. So the speed limit currently is 45. It will be reduced to 35 as you pass through those intersections on Route 5. Um, so that will be implemented at the same time the other project is. And Centerville between Route 5000 Monticello and Route 5 will be closed during the project. Um, completed a few speed studies or traffic studies. Um, Route 606, Riverview Road, we're installing uh, turn warning signs at the curve. Um, Route 1502, Bardella Drive at Adams Hunt Drive, we installed a yield sign. Uh, route 648, Howard Drive, and five other routes uh, along 60 have installed stationary 25 mile an hour signs. Could you just explain that a little bit to me, Mr. Mr. Carroll? Yeah, um, what happens is statutory anyway, but a lot of people um, have issues with people speeding and stuff of that nature. So what happens, they request that as you enter, we have some sort of 25 mile an hour posted. Um, we don't always post um, because when you're in uh, residential areas it's statutory it should be 25 but sometimes we say yes we're going to put them up uh, especially if we're finding that the 85th percentile is a little high um, trying to help with common traffic with a speed limit sign <laughs> um, route 5 speed study which we just talked about that and uh, the route 30 speed study, um, which did, we should be complete with that by the end of this month. So more news after that. Um, we should have something out on that. Um, that pretty much concludes my uh, quarterly update. I'd be glad to take any questions or comments or um, I have a few, unless anyone would like go to go first. Speaking of calming traffic, first of all, um, thank you for your help with everything that you do around the county. Um, do you have any kind of an update in regards to the speed limit reduction going into Barhamsville? We did the Zoom call with Delegate Batten and Delegate Wyatt and Representative Lockwood and yourself and I do. Um, a plethora of engineers. And then that was the that was a speed study I was just referring okay, to. Okay, good. Um, that will be completed at the end of this month. Um, it took a little longer than I anticipated. Okay. We actually did two different studies. When I say we, part of that section is in Richmond District, the VDOT. Right. Part of that section is in Hampton Roads District. Both traffic engineers, district engineers, did their own studies. Um, they did not 
blend and they did not match. Um, so you mean from our, our end and the New Kent end, what, you know, part of it's in New Kent, part of it's in right. James City County. The two um, didn't get the same findings, and we wanted it to be a corridor, you know, that that went through both districts, um, but to be um, to match up. So what happened at that point? Then we went back, and I don't know if you saw this. We went out and put new tubes out, got new traffic counts, new speeds. Um, for the whole corridor, and now we're developing a combined speed study. So both traffic engineers will sign one study. The study will be, um, will match from Barnesville all the way to Fieldstone Parkway through that section um, or corridor that goes through both counties, and that's supposed to be completed by the end of this month. So um, once that is signed, sealed, and printed, uh, we will schedule another follow-up um, Zoom meeting and uh, discuss the findings. Because okay. I'm still getting phone calls, so I'd like to be sure, able to sure. give updates to yeah, folks. We, we're, Thank you. We're, we've continuously um, been studying that section. Um, it's a pretty dangerous area. It is very narrow. I mean, it's, you, you run into, the, you know, the 85th out there is 59, 60 miles an hour. Um, but most of the accidents, believe it or not, are not speed related. Well, hopefully if people slow down, maybe it'll prevent some of it anyway. Hopefully. We're trying. Um, I do have a few other things, okay. um, if I might. Um, so the Rochambeau stage road um, situation. So I'm sure, as we, you mentioned to me earlier, I know your phones are blowing up, mine's blowing up. Um, people are concerned about that right out off of St Old Stage Road. Um, some of the things that um, that I'd like to make sure, it, am I correct in that you're going to be monitoring that area on a regular basis to make sure it's working like it ought to for safety reasons? Yes. And can I, uh, can I talk about it a little bit? Oh, please that's do. Funny? Okay. Um, there's been a lot of questions as to why we're doing the right out at Old Stage. Um, and just to go back, we've, we've done a lot of studies at that intersection of Schoolhouse, um, Rochambeau, and Old Stage Road. Uh, this latest study was a roadway safety assessment where we partnered with um, local government, the school divisions, the operations, police department. Kind of everybody got together and said, all right, what is going on with this intersection? Um, and after the study, we looked at the three-year crash history. Um, and what stood out to us um, was part of that RSA. Uh, what stood out to us as a quick hitter item is that 55% of all the accidents in that intersection are going or happening by vehicles coming out of old stage, either going straight or left. 78% of all the injuries over the past three years have been that same movement. 82% of those accidents have been outside of what I call the AM and PM peaks. And the peak is determined by the school's pick up and drop off. Um, so some people have asked me, why didn't we do it just during the peak hours in the AM, peak hours in the PM, when the flashing light is at 35, we could understand that. But um, as you dive into the, the, the crash history, um, it shows that the crashes are happening outside of those target areas. Um, so that's why it went to a right only. Now, having the right out at old stage, um, I've heard concerns of how it in, it, it'll lengthen my commute time or lengthen my commute route. Um, what we have done, we've modeled that intersection and the intersection, um, the, the crossover just down from it. Um, One by Whitehall? Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what we're gonna what we're gonna do is we have we have a left turn lane at that intersection. We've also uh, modeled the turning radius so we've added about eight foot of asphalt on the shoulder uh, going eastbound on Route 30 at that intersection as well so that buses, track and trailers have the bigger vehicles have plenty of room to make that U-turn. What it does by doing this one movement, and, and from our RSA, we had 
short-term, sort of intermediate, long-term solutions. This is a short-term solution. This is the biggest bang for your dollar, per se, because it, it affects over 50% of the accidents that are happening in the intersection, and it, and it also addresses 78% of the injuries by accident. Um, so after all of that, what it's going to do is vehicles will come out and will have to take a right. Um, as you pull up in this intersection, if you're familiar with it, it's very wide intersection. There are 32 um, decision points. There's 32 points on that intersection. So when you're at old stage trying to go left or straight, you have to figure out what the people in the left turn lanes, people in, in schoolhouse lane, then you have to negotiate westbound and eastbound traffic, and all that decisioning um, and turn lane there at the left, all that decisioning at one time. Here, as you come out, you have to take a right, because it's right only. So you have to make sure that you are clear for, from, the, from the eastbound side. So that'd be westbound traffic. Make sure you're clear. You go down to the left turn lane, and then you're just looking at eastbound traffic if you're heading back east. Um, so you'd be looking towards Anderson's Corner. Nobody's coming there. You make that U-turn, and you also have to look at people coming out of Whitehall. Um, so what it does, it, it, instead of 32, now there's only 21 uh, points of contact in that intersection just by, just by deleting that one movement, that straight or left out of old stage. We do think, because old stage will back up during the peak, um, some, especially when school's in session and we have, so people are, that are trying to go straight or left, you can't take a right because there's not enough room there. So they have to, they have to kind of judge whether they can go or not. Is it your turn to go? Is it my turn to go? This way, you know, you only take a right. Um, so that, that decision is a lot quicker. If no one's coming to my left, take a right. And then the same thing. There, we think during the peak hours, you actually will get through the intersection faster than you normally would coming out of old stage. And if no one's coming, so normally I'd pull out, no one's coming, it's only a 25 to 40 second increase of time to get to maneuver through that intersection. Some of the um, concerns I've heard is the U-turn the, um, where you make in front of Whitehall, mm -hmm. the turn lane there, they're concerned that it may not be long enough and then people are coming up 55 miles an hour, and that would pose a problem there. So as you're monitoring, if we you... We will monitor, and we, we, okay. did, we modeled it. We okay. think it is, but if it's not, um, you're right. We will have to do some adjustments. Okay. I will say that you asked me, was it permanent? Um, our intentions, I am not installing a concrete pork chop or, or median area. Um, we're going to do it with striping, um, breakaway delineators, signage, um, stuff that can be adjusted, and we're going to continue to monitor this for the next year to make sure that we are achieving, you know, what we're trying to do, and that's safety improvements, reduction in injuries, reduction in accidents, um, better, better maneuverability through the intersection, those type of things. Now, there are intermediate and long-term um, recommendations based off of that study that, that take longer to program, much more costly. You know, we'd have to... Um, generate the funds or, or program the funds to do those type of projects. Um, and, and we've done, you know, a lot of people say stoplights. Um, we've done these studies. We've, I think we've done two total in there for uh, signal justifications. Um, currently, it does not warrant it. And if you install a signal, um, and this is pretty much backed up by the Federal Highway Administration, if you install a signal um, without certain warrants being met, you inherit some additional safety concerns. Rear ends, um, it takes longer to get through the intersection, um, stuff of that nature. So um, we will continue to monitor to see if it meets the warrants for a signal, um, but currently it doesn't right now. And if in the turnaround little median area I mentioned to you earlier, if you could put some striping, striping there. there. Yeah, so people, because people still <laughs> can't figure out which lane to be in to turn which way, that would be very helpful. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, couple other things, um, if I might. I'm sorry to take up so much time. Um, a little bit later in our agenda, we're going to be shifting some funding for pedestrian bikeway um, from Norge over to, I believe, the Grove area. 
to the tune of about three hundred twenty-four thousand dollars. Some of the concern that I have and that I've heard, had, um, and I spoke with uh, Mr. Croft earlier today. He's here, and I share his um, his concerns as a twenty-seven year resident of Toano and a supporter of the Toano revital revitalization project. Thank you for being here. Rich, um, we talked about some of the the, the lack of um, pedestrian crosswalks in that Toano area. Now, had we had some of those extras approved, maybe we could have applied that funding that we're shifting out of Stonehouse and kept it in Stonehouse District and applied it towards some crosswalks. The concern that I have is I believe that it's been um, determined to put one, a crosswalk at the Forge Road intersection. I'll just tell you, as a mom and a grandmom, I would never let my kids cross the street right there. That is a dangerous spot, even if you're in a car, much less trying to cross it with fire trucks and people going this way. You're picking up speed. You're going from 45 to 55 and 55 to 45. It's just, it's a crazy little spot. And to me, and I think to Mr. Crop's point, it makes more sense, and I know you're going to be putting a turn lane at Burnt Ordinary to go towards McLean's, and that poses a problem, but it makes more sense to put a crosswalk where people cross. The people are still going to cross right there, go there and then do the same. To get, then it's just not going to happen. So my concern is, and I know Peg Borman with the Rear Tans, she's probably called you. They're working on trying to come up with some sort of a solution for a crosswalk in that area. I don't know what we can do or if you're willing to talk with me about a, some kind of potential solution to actually solve a problem rather than maybe create another one. So I, I'll be glad to work. OK, with you. I will. Uh, I will say I can give a little bit of history and, and she's referring to the there's a, the county has a revenue share project um, that's getting some VDOT funding as well, mm -hmm. um, which does all that in, right. in there. But um, I have looked at a what they call mid-block crossing, mm -hmm. and that would be a mid-block crossing at that area. Um, we have done the done that study before, and it was determined not to be a good location. Not to say that um, it's not worth looking at again, but I can tell you that we have, before this project, um, looked at you know, putting the beacons in, having a refuge, because you have to put some sort of refuge if you're crossing multiple lanes um, in the median there um, so that you could cross. Um, right now, it currently has what I consider an open lane, a turn, open turn lane uh, in that middle there. Um, so you would have to figure out some way to close that to have some sort of pedestrian refuge. people stand in the middle of it. They do, they do. I, I can't say it's the safest thing to do, and people are gonna do what they feel safe doing, but that would not, as a, as a traffic engineer, that would not be where I would advise people to cross. So how do you combine traffic engineer with grandma now, common me, sense? This is what I'm not a traffic engineer. Okay, so, well, but if but I, I know you. That's not what so I'm, I'm trying to combine the two so that we, as I said, don't create a worse problem and try to solve a situation that we have. Because I know as the revitalization, revitalization project proceeds, hopefully we'll have a little bit more traffic in that area, visiting some of our shops and our stores and I mean, they're often running to with a with a great project and a great idea, and we already have a situation there that is potentially dangerous. I, I so, mean, I'll be glad to look thank at you. it. I think that I project, it. Um, Mr. Croft, appreciates it one. as well. He'll be he'll be happy to do a conference call with us. He's shaking his head yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, I think I was taking notes. Thank you. I'm sorry to take up so much time, but I've had a lot of phone calls, so I just wanted to make sure I could. Um, to cover all that. So thank you so much. I appreciate your attention to, to all these matters. You're welcome. Carol, I've got just three things, and they're all thank yous. One is uh, the potholes uh, that, uh, along Monticello, especially the entranceway where there was that seam between the lanes. So nice job patching it in a timely order because... And I really say it, I'm, I'm sorry it took so long. Well, we, yeah. we had to do it at night because yeah. of how much traffic, traffic is out yeah. there, and that intersection is such oh, a it's tough a, intersection. It's a busy, busy intersection, and, and it was uh, getting pretty bad, so I appreciate that. Um, the uh, uh, second thing uh, was uh, I want to thank you very much for 
the uh, um, real quick uh, response uh, on getting the uh, crosswalk in on Ironbound. Uh, I've gotten some very good feedback from the neighbors there. Uh, this is uh, one that connects the uh, uh, the meadows to over at the park, so where all the kids go to Kidsburg. So. Uh, Really happy to finally get that there, and I want to thank you and thank the county staff for uh, taking the lead and getting that uh, that project up and running real real well. Um, and I had one other, but I can't think of it, so uh, I'll let Ruth take over. Good afternoon. Thank you for for being here. Uh, go back to one thing that you said about drainage, and I didn't hear when you were talking about it that you said much about cleaning out ditches in residential areas and wondered where you were with that because I had gotten some calls that there was a lot of debris in some neighborhood ditches and we've called VDOT. They said they're way behind on that. So maybe if you could just give me a status update on that. And what I, I, I can tell you that we, our focus is on drainage. Um, I can tell you that our contractor that we utilize for drainage uh, was impacted by COVID, um, and they are currently not able to, I mean, this has been going on for a while, have not been able to um, do the truck ditching like we normally have in the area. We have our own truck ditches, but we also have other priorities as well. Um, however, uh, we are shifting our focus to try to get caught up on some of the backlogged uh, drainage ditches. I will say that we're also looking at um, implementing what I consider a specialty crew in the residency um, to focus on ditching shoulder pipe repair, sinkhole repair, stuff of that nature. Um, is another Another way that we're trying to catch up, um, and these are new positions, so um, I do not expect that to be in place until next fiscal year, um, but you have to plan towards it. Okay. Um, the other issue was I have a, some, some roads or a road in um, the landfall neighborhood that I know that um, – we have someone here on staff that's been trying to work with BDOT to get an inspect William Tankard. There's a retaining wall involved. I didn't know if you knew where th we were in that. I'm very familiar with it. Um, the, uh, the walkthrough was scheduled at 1.30 today. Okay. Um, that's about all I have of that. I do know that the retaining wall that you um, yes. reference is outside of the right-of-way in which they're looking at bringing into the state maintenance system. Okay. So it would most likely not be brought into this state? At this current time, it's not in the right-of-way, so no, it definitely would not be okay. brought into the system. But I can tell you that um, in projects past, uh, we do have, we look at retaining walls very, um, very closely, um, whether they meet any standard or anything of that nature, just because of the significance of them because normally they're in wetland areas, um, and then normally they submit right away. Um. Okay. Yeah, that, that retaining wall is of great concern to not only the person whose house is right near it um, because of the, the height, et cetera, but uh, several other neighbors have expressed concern as well. So um, Yeah. Um, as, I, as I said, the roadway, the public right-of-way is not in our system, so it's really hard for me to comment too much on it because we haven't brought that part into our system. And that's what they're doing the walkthrough today okay. to, to develop some sort of punch list um, for that public right-of-way section. Okay. Um, however, the, the, the retaining wall is outside of that right-of-way, um, which probably is property owner, HOA, that, that type of concern. Okay, thank you. Um, so the so the other um, issue that that I have is regarding the um, intersection. I, I'm sitting here just hoping you have the kind of statistics that you just gave Ms. Sadler, that you have those for me as well about I do. Route Five in Centerville. I do. We did um, a complete RSA on it. Okay, <laughs> I'm prepared for it. I am. <laughs> um, 
first of all, I, I feel that I, I that I do need to state that we have been talking about this for ye, for year. I think as long as I've been on the board, which is about five years. We did our town hall we in 2019. Town, we did a town hall in 2019. This was one of the options that was given. Um, we we have an issue there, um, and. So I do appreciate, I, so whatever is said today, I do want you to know that I do appreciate that, that I feel like we're making some movement. It is movement that has displeased a few people. Um, I don't know whether you've heard from anybody, but I've heard from lots of people, um, and not to see how I'm doing. It's not been that kind of call. Right. Um, <laughs> but I can relate. <laughs> um, so I look forward to hearing those statistics. I think the only other thing I would have appreciated was maybe a little, it, it's hard when something like that comes out at 4.30 in the afternoon and then I'm playing catch up because I got a call from the county and they said, hey, VDOT's getting ready to release this and it was late in the afternoon so I wasn't able to, you know, I, not that it would have caused any less upset necessarily, but maybe if I had been able to give a little bit more of a lead in rather than this Thursday la last week. So, um, but please dazzle me with your data. Well, uh, you've seen the data that I have and that was, and I kind of go back on a little bit of history is, you know, there's always been a concern with the safety um, of the offset intersection between Green Springs and Centerville at Route 5. Right. Um, we've had some horrific accidents. We've had a lot of accidents. Um, majority, I think 64% of them are rear end accidents. Another 18 to 20% of them are angles. So people pulling out in front of people. Um, a majority of those accidents are at Centerville and five, not Green Springs and five. Um, so with that said, um, and I think it was, I'll look back in the RSA. I have it here with me, but I don't have the numbers sure. in my head um but i think it was like 55 percent of all the accidents in that intersection were people back running into the back of people turning left on a centerville coming from green springs um go ahead so the the concerns that i'm hearing are additional time because a mile I, and a half either way and and there's two options to that. Um, if, if you are on Green Springs and want to get on Centerville, um, you can make a left and go to the signal at Monticello and then make a right, go to the signal at Centerville and to make a left onto Centerville. Or you can make a right out of Green Springs and go up to uh, Green Springs Plantation at the signal, Jamestown High School, make a left there and then make a left on Monticello back to Centerville. It's about a mile and a half to two miles, either either way. Um, both of them are very close um, in, in length. Um, one of them has one signal, one of them has two signals. So um, depends upon what kind of, what time of day, you may have um, some backup at signals as you normally do that you have to go through um, versus just the that. but. And all in all, um, we did model both of those routes and found that both of them should be safe. Um, looked at site distances and the current uh, crash rates at those intersections and uh, knowing that additional traffic will be probably evenly split, split between those two intersections, depending upon it's, it's really personal choice, you know, which way you rather go. Um, so most of the concern seems to be over the um, in the worry over an increase in at Green Springs Plantation turning left onto Monticello. Mm -hmm. um, there's there there's quite a bit of worry that there's going to be increased accidents there. Um, I, I haven't followed up with Scott yet. I did ask him to reach out to the schools. I, I'm, I'm assuming the high, the high school buses go that way currently. I, I don't think they would 
them down. And, Maybe well, they, they can do, still, but if I they don't... still come from the high school, they can make a right on Centerville if that's the way, but there's no one that lives in the Right. Section. No, I think they go straight, I, I would, would think. think. But mm -hmm. um, so there's, so hopefully we can watch that. And mm -hmm. I, and I believe that this, um, you had said you're going to watch this for 12 months. That is. Um, so hopefully we can um, see if there's an increase. Though, as I have tried to also bring up with people, we've had to go that way several times recently because of the water overage Funny. on Centerville. Um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how many days that road's been closed, but it's been a lot with all the rain. We're trying to address that, but that's something that's on the National Park Service property. Right. Um, I did see a, a, like a backhoe last week. When we had it closed. We were working within our right-of-way. Okay, yeah. We were. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, yes, I, but I did see that they were trying to work on on the. Um, yes, we we were working within our right away. Right. But, but, I wasn't trying to. That's what I was trying to point out. But there is some issue downstream that that is. We never had this issue before, so there's something changed downstream, um, that is making this water back up. Because um, I've I've been in the Williamsburg residency as their administrator for the over ten years, and past six months that this rainy season Centerville is I've closed it more than I have the past 10 years right um, just because of that so um, but it's good to hear that you did model that one and you don't we mo anticipate we modeled we modeled all of that okay. as part of that as part of that RSA process or so once the recommendations came out then we modeled both routes um, really for turning movements for accidents for increase in volume um, all of those type of things were in that modeling um, scenarios. And, um, I mean, long-term, as we discussed also at that public meeting, there is there, there are some solutions, which would, I think, one that, that we looked at was a more of an alignment of the road with the roundabout. Um, but... That's not that's not out of the question yet, but there is not the funding available right at this time in order to do that. It's not, and and both of these RSAs or, or their scenarios are like there's a what I call a quick hitter or a uh, immediate type project, and that was this project. Um, it's something small that affects that has a a good return in investment, and that like here was fifty five percent. Most of the accidents are at Centerville. By taking those movements out of the equation, um, you would affect what is really driving that intersection safety rating up. Um, but same at this intersection, we're installing the right in, right out, but with striping, breakaway delineators, and signage. Um, and then, plus, I, I said that the speed reduction is going to be done at the same time, starting Thursday. Um, we will continue to monitor. If I need to adjust, it's not like I went out there and spent fifty thousand dollars putting a, uh, a mountable curb uh, pork chop in that intersection. Um, I can adjust, eradicate, and adjust as needed. Um, and, and I'm sure that um, as we monitor. Um, if it's not affecting or we're not getting the results that we want, um, then, you know, we'll make adjustments from that. Thank you so much. Welcome. Appreciate it. Hey, Mr. Carroll, good to see you. Good to see um, you. Uh, we're giving you a <laughs> pretty uh, thorough workout today. It was uh, a work session. Appreciate. That's what I like. <laughs> appreciate it very much. Uh, uh, so let me start off with uh, just a couple of, of uh, thanks again. Uh, uh, I'm really pleased to see the um, aggressive uh, schedule for um, the Skiffs Creek connector. I think that'll be a, a, a real uh, important uh, addition to our road network and, and uh, glad to see that it's working so quickly, uh, working its way through the process so quickly. And I also wanted to say that uh, you know it seems like uh, there's a little bit more breathing room in terms of finances locally because we are seeing more um, paving projects coming along and some some good news uh, here and there. And I do want to especially thank you for uh, making sure that uh, the Colony Lake Powell Road area were included in, in this year's after they've been waiting for about 30 years, I think, for, yeah. for repaving. 
really do appreciate that tremendously. And to see that Necca Land Road is also included in that, apparently. Um, so that's, that's great. Uh, um, but I, I, as far as Necca Land Road is concerned, I did have, have an issue there that I'd, I hope that you might be able to help with. Um, uh, toward the end of Necca Land Road, um, right down toward the um, Colonial uh, uh, Park, uh, not uh, to uh, yeah, Colonial Parkway um, uh, and the National Park Service maintenance area, um, it appears that uh, the owner of a couple of duplexes right down there has installed a clay berm, uh, or maybe it's maybe it's just soil, but they have managed to block the drainage path uh, for water, and it's causing flooding on both sides of Neckaland Road um, at, at this point. Uh, there's a James City Service Authority pump station there um, th that when I saw it uh, last week uh, had s um, several inches of water coming up toward it just uh, after after a fairly heavy rain. Uh, there's a fire hydrant sitting in the middle of this large lake that's been that is created after heavy rains. And on um, the um, Roberts District side of Neckerland Road, uh, there's also significant uh, flooding that is taking place. Uh, it appeared off the roadway, not on the roadway, but it also it seemed to me, and I didn't measure it, but it looked to me as if that berm was within the 25 foot from the center line uh, range. I don't know that for a fact, but, but it looked like it. And it certainly is causing some serious uh, erosion problems and uh, lack of flow of, of water off the properties, creating flooding where I'd never seen it before. I will certainly look into it and uh, at, and get back with you. I, I'm not familiar with it, so it's, it's hard for me uh, to comment. It's a couple of duplexes out, at, at uh, 532. Um, is that the address? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. 532 Neckerland Road. Uh, so thank you for that. I was interested in your in um, you're talking about uh, trying to do some additional work on drainage, knowing that this is I, I mean it's a never-ending problem here. Um, and I don't know if you can comment on this at all in particular. It's not a specific concern, but rather a, a more generalized one. Um, it seems over time, as uh, developments have been in place for a while, a lot of the drainage ditches that have been put in place don't function properly anymore because of settlement of, of uh, the uh, uh, land, uh, the, um, the fact that the, the um, Pipes underneath driveways um, no longer mesh up with with the um, uh, flow line of the ditch line. That's right. Open that's ditches. right. And so nothing's moving um, in in those areas. And I just wondered, is that something that uh, has a solution? Well, um, I mean, it depends. Um, and and generality is kind of hard to to be specific about. But um, as pipes settle or move. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have an offset, the highest pipe downstream will hold all the water at that level. Um, so if, if the ditch is dropped and this pipe is above elevation or above the invert for the next two pipes, there's going to be water in that pipe. Not to say it's going to flood, because once it gets up to this level of this highest pipe, it will flow through. But water stays in the ditch longer. Yes, right but it's not a flooding situation. Okay. Um, I, I, that's generalities. I'm just saying that a lot of times you get, over time, right. pipes settle or move. Yep. Um, and, and what used to be a dry ditch after it rained now has four inches of water in it that sits. Open ditch systems also not only drain surface water, but as the rains stop, the surface water runs off, mm -hmm. it also dra drains the properties. So the properties right. drain into the ditch as well. If you've ever seen how water leaches out of a bank, it does the same thing at an open ditch system, which you don't get as much of with a closed, piped in DI, that type of system. Um, so that continues to run some during wet, wet times, um, which adds to water in the ditch line. But as long as water is not, um, well, I don't even want to say this, but at a normal rain, as long as water is flowing, um, it is functioning. It may not function as great as it was when it's new, just like my car doesn't function quite as well as it was when it was new, but it's still functioning. 
Um, what happens <laughs> um, as, as these ditches get filled in, um, you get less and less, they can handle less and less water. And that's where we try to come back and come through and get the ditches cut back to the flow line. And when I say the flow line, that's sort of the bottom of the pipes or the elevations that have set during the drainage as the, as the road was designed. Mm -hmm. A lot of the rains that we've received, um, none of those drainage structures were designed for anything greater than 10-year storm. Most of them are probably around four or five-year storm. Um, Which we now we, have about every receive, two months. And right? we receive a lot of storms that uh, exceed that four to ten year uh, limits. So when you get that much rain, you know, inch an hour, inch every two hours, uh, for extended period of time, um, and most of these areas, if they're in a subdivision, drain to a BMP that has a level as well. So that BMP gets inundated. So as high as that BMP raises, you can back it all the way up at that same elevation. There's, that water is going to be in those ditches to the height of the water at, in the BMP that, that, that it's going. Um, so what happens? We get so much rain, it has nowhere to go. So then it starts exceeding the banks of the ditches, you know, wh whatever size the ditches are. So then that's when you get the street flooding, the property flooding, uh, those type of things from water that's been running down the ditches. Now, when you have those type of rains, you have little areas in your yards that are going to flood anyway, and areas that normally drain towards the right-of-way do not drain as fast because the right-of-way drainage is inundated. Um, but that's generalities. I, I can look at any drainage structure or, or drainage situation and see if there's an issue um, that we can correct. Um, so, so I, I will say that we maintain what's in the right of way. A lot of these subdivisions, we maintain what's in the right of way, um, but a lot of the outfalls are outside of our right of way responsibility. Right. Yeah, and, and um, I'll come back to that in just a second. But uh, um, one of the kinds of the kinds of facilities where I see um, uh, kind of persistent um, remaining water over long periods of time plus sedimentation will be where there are concrete um, culverts in place. Um, the, the water just doesn't flow at all. It, it just sits there for not two or three days, but a week at a time or more. Uh, and when it finally does evaporate, uh, uh, it leaves behind a residue that homeowners complain they, you know, they are responsible to clean out those areas and it's kind of a muddy mess. Um, I, and I there's probably an issue there, unless the ditch is below the culvert. And when I say the elevation of the ditch is lower than the culvert, you have to actually add. Normally, they silt yes. in themselves. Yes, and that's, <laughs> you know, that, time, that's precisely what I. That, that's precisely what I think I'm. I'm seeing mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, uh, there is that uh, elevation difference. And um, there may be. And, and there is there a way be. to deal with that? Uh, you can fill a ditch in which uh -huh. most of the time we're cleaning ditches out. But, yeah, right. <laughs> but um, you can fill a ditch in, regrade it to a, you know, to a new elevation. Okay. Um, uh, I'll ask, but I'll give you a couple say this. Of... Normally, if you have a dam, and I'm going to call the dam the invert of the pipe, mm -hmm. and the ditch is lower than it, mm -hmm. over time, the ditch will fill up to that dam level or the invert of the pipe. Right. Um, sediment falls out of water which continues to build, not by, maybe not quite as fast as we would like, um, but when we, we countersink a lot of pipes now that we never used to countersink for, six, eight inches below the existing elevations, just to hold that, that sediment base, you know, through the pipe. Um, if those driveways were countersunk, you would see that they, you know, you would have that sediment base that ran through the pipe versus the pipe sitting here and the ditch, um, the bottom of the ditch, you know, four, five, six inches below, below the pipe. I assume that the last time the ditch was cleaned out, it was cleaned out too deep. 
I, I'll probably just send you a couple of examples of places um, just to, to see if, if we're sort of thinking in the same vein here. Um, but, um, and I just would note that, you know, I know this has been an incredibly wet yes. period of time, uh, but I'm not quite willing to admit that it's not going to continue to be um, uh, higher levels of rainfall, high, uh, more severe storms and so forth. And I'm, I'm noticing that I know a lot of work that you guys have, have done to try to improve the situation on Lake Powell um, just past the airport. Um, but it sure seems like it's getting ready to start covering the road up again. Thank you very much for all your efforts to deal with nature and its consequences. All right, I've just got a few things. I want to thank you on the old Route 60 there for um, smoothing out those bumps and um, getting the um, grass off the sides where the water had a few um, people call me on that, and y'all got right on that, and I appreciate that. It allowed that water to get off into the ditch and not be held up on the old road there. So that was a plus. Um, Barnes Road for that um, pothole in the middle that, after y'all finished paving it, it cropped right back up. I don't know, water I guess came up from the bottom of it, but um, so I know y'all are on that, and either today or tomorrow we're gonna take care of that, so thank you for that and, and getting that straight. I, know the, I haven't gotten a call down there yet. I was surprised as big as the area had gotten that none of the citizens had called me to said, hey, can you ride down the road there and look at what we've got? So I'm glad we'll take care of it before they get to calling us, so that'll work out great. And the um, little spot on Ford Road there, you're taking care of that one, the other one that we talked about earlier, um, right beside it, there's some cracking in the road and that sort of thing, and and uh, maybe we can fill that before. And and that's always where that water comes across, that, that one area by the firehouse. And um, you got the one section and the other section closer to the, the if you're heading towards 60 on the right-hand lane, you'll see it. And... Um, so if you take care of that, we're we're good on everything. Nope. Do have uh, the spray injection ender patching, you know, the spray injection right. ender patching in that area. So yep. our intention is to, I think we've done some patching on Forge yeah. Road, but the, the alligator cracking, yep. uh, our intentions are to try to seal that with that ender. Right, uh, and ender I think tight patching. I think that would work. I just see it getting a little bit bigger, and I know that, you know, with all the track of, traffic and with, and with all the rain we've had it is and, and this is pothole season it is you know i mean it we, is. we are um our focus is trying to uh catch up on potholes as well um about two weeks ago uh i felt like all that was all we were doing day and night um trying to to at least get the holes filled so we didn't have property damage claims and, and stuff of that nature and i know in 34 years in business this has been the wettest season I've seen. I mean, we've just been inundated with rain. I hope we get some when we need it in the summertime, but I'm worried <laughs> we'll drop then. But time will tell. I appreciate any other questions or y'all have concerns. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, next we'll go into number five, briefing on the engagement 2020, 2045 comprehensive plan update. Tammy Rosero and Ellen Cook, welcome. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Today's presentation will focus on the progress to date on the Engage 2045 Comprehensive Plan Update process. Joining me are other members of the planning team, Ellen Cook from staff who will help present, and Vlad Gavrilovich of EPRPC who will help answer questions via phone, and Rich Krop, Chair of the Planning Commission and Planning Commission Working Group to help answer questions and to provide Planning Commission Working Group perspective. Next. We are grateful to have this opportunity to present highlights of important milestone work completed by the Community Participation Team and the Planning Commission Working Group these past five months. Namely, these are the public engagement results from our last round of public engagement, the deciding and affirming phase, and the draft chapter materials and revised goals, strategies, and actions that the Planning Commission Working Group has been uh, forming uh, all along. This is intended to be a high-level briefing 
Certainly, there were more data and links to even more material covered by the CPT and the Planning Commission Working Group in your packet. Our goals today are to introduce you to this material, to ask you to share any questions and thoughts at this time, but more particularly to give us any feedback over the next 30 days as staff and the Planning Commission Working Group look to have a joint work session with the Board in May in preparation for the Planning Commission having a public hearing on the draft plan this summer. Next. To orient us, we are 21 months into our approximately two-year process. In terms of community engagement, we have completed the listening and envision envisioning round, the exploring and testing round, and we recently completed the third round, deciding and affirming. That was our last formal round. Uh, the next phase is more of an informal uh, opportunity for public input uh, that we will collect and forward on to the Planning Commission Working Group. In terms of project phase, we have, can go back one more please? Uh, we have completed uh, laying the foundation, scenario and model building, alternative futures, and we are now uh, in affirming the direction. We are building our draft plan based on the direction provided by the community. Thank you. As a reminder, round three is not a standalone point of input. It is part of a cumulative set of engagement inputs that build our understanding of the wishes and desires of the community and that point to specifically specific policy directions and actions. This started with taking uh, cues from the 2035 comprehensive plan and reviewing the inputs from the citizen survey, round one, round two, and now round three inputs. And we will follow that up, as I mentioned, with um, any um, individual comments shared by citizens and comments made at the round four public hearings. Next. The CPT used these previous inputs and the Planning Commission Working Group discussions to design the deciding and affirming round of engagement. The two main elements were three questionnaires and a series of community chats. The questionnaires probed deeper on particular subjects and were intended to be the sole way to provide feedback. The community chats provided an opportunity for citizens to ask questions and to get clarifications on the questionnaires and the planning process, a virtual open house, if you will. Next. Mindful of its public outreach goals and the challenges of the pandemic, the CPT doubled its efforts to reach the public. In addition to the methods used in previous rounds, the CPT and the planning team included an insert in the real estate billing mailing to 20,000 households in the county, extended the engagement period to six weeks, disseminated and collected paper questionnaires at 11 locations geographically distributed throughout the county, and offered weekly drawings of prizes to local small businesses. As you can see, this resulted in a significantly higher yield of comments, a total of 580 responses, which surpassed both the first and second rounds of input. Next, please. This is just a, an idea of how our paper questionnaire responses uh, uh, yielded responses. We had 42 total uh, come into us via paper, 35 alone from the Recreation Center, but several from the Satellite Office and several from the library. Next. Just uh, a, a couple of words about each of the questionnaires. Uh, to your uh, right on the screen is an image of our paper questionnaire. Of course, this was paralleled by our online version. The Policies and Actions Questionnaire asked for opinions on potential policies and actions to implement citizens' visions for the future in the priority areas of nature, economic development, quality of life, and workforce affordable housing. Next. The Character Design Guidelines Questionnaire used the MetroQuest platform sought and sought opinions on the future appearance of neighborhoods, open spaces, and commercial areas in the community. The future land use map questionnaire, this again is the paper version. Uh, we also had an interactive map version on, on the county website. Shared details about 27 applications for land use map designation changes in an interactive map and provided a direct way for citizens to share their comments about each application. Next. 
as a way of summarizing all of the input received through those three questionnaires, and not to go into too much detail today, um, our consultant prepared these summary statements for each of the priority areas, uh, which was previously shared with the community participation team and the planning commission working group. I'll just uh, read them briefly. Uh, for nature, there was consistent public support to prioritize the protection of natural lands and open spaces in the county. This was the most highly ranked and supported objective across three rounds of engagement. For round three, residents support new development restrictions and public land acquisition to limit development impacts on natural lands and to address impacts of climate change with a strong focus on protecting water resources. For community character, there was consistent public support to prioritize protection of the county's unique community character particularly the character of rural lands and communities in the community. In round three, there was more support for styles of development that reduce development intensity. However, there was evidence that middle density land uses could be supported with county, within the county with compatible designs and the incorporation of nature. Respondents expressed more support for density within mixed use and employment contexts that provided walkability and opportunities for interaction. Next. In terms of affordable workforce housing, there was consistent public support to provide more opportunities for affordable workforce housing. However, there was less support for prioritizing resources to support this objective. Round three residents identified adaptive reuse and development, redevelopment of existing commercial and employment locations and transit corridors as the best locations for new affordable housing. Strategies to improve homes in existing residential neighborhoods and stabilize and enhance mobile home parks were also strongly supported. In terms of economic development, there was consistent public support to diversify the local economy with a focus on development of higher wage employment. In round three, this topic had less support for prioritizing resources to this endeavor, but still strongly supported as an overall objective. Round three, respondents expressed mixed support for the county investing in infrastructure to serve economic development sites within the primary service area. For development of complete communities that can support future economic growth, there was a preference for more mixed-use centers with employment and adding more middle-density housing to existing employment areas. And for the last planning priority, quality of life, there was consistent support for enhancing quality of life amenities in James City County with a strong emphasis on walking and biking facilities. Round three respondents supported prioritizing county resources for enhancing quality of life amenities. They also supported prioritizing walking and biking amenities in locations that increase connectivity between neighborhoods and shopping, schools, employment areas, and greenways. With that, I'll turn it over to my coworker, Ellen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. At the last comprehensive plan briefing with the board in October, the board affirmed exploring the concepts described in the plan framework document and the preferred scenario framework document. These documents contained new policy ideas for exploration and consideration to build upon ideas in the plan already. The concepts in these documents, as well as other public input, guidance from relevant agencies and departments, guidance from the Planning Commission Working Group and other sources, and information from the strategic plan have been integrated into revised chapter materials and goals, strategies, and actions for the chapters. The memo provided as part of today's packet highlights some of the more substantive changes in each chapter that have been discussed by the Planning Commission Working Group. For more detailed information, the GSA documents were included as an attachment in the packet, and a link was provided in the memo to the full sets of chapter materials. Please note that the Planning Commission Working Group has provided feedback on the draft GSAs and other documents and worked to address this feedback, as well as to incorporate the results of the third round of public engagement, is ongoing and will move into final reviews during April and May. The highlights for each chapter provided in the memo include substantive changes in the text and significant GSA considerations, including revisions and new actions. One GSA item of note across all chapters was the re-examination and revision of the goal statements to reflect input from the goals questionnaire that was part of the second round of public engagement. 
Staff requests the board's review of the GSAs and other documents and appreciates any thoughts in the next 30 days on any major items of concern, any items of importance to the board that are not addressed to date, or any questions. Next slide. In April, at the board work session, staff hopes to provide the draft land use chapter and draft future land use map, along with other related documents for board review. In May, a joint work session with the Planning Commission Working Group is planned. This May meeting will be an important time for staff and the Planning Commission Working Group to receive final guidance on the materials presented in March and April, and to ensure there are no significant items of concern remaining in the materials or with proposed new land use policy. Following the May joint work session, staff and the Planning Commission Working Group will incorporate final revisions and prepare the draft comprehensive plan for an anticipated public hearing with the Planning Commission in June and for an anticipated public hearing with the Board in July and consideration in September. Next. We look forward to receiving the Board's thoughts and questions on today's packet materials in the next 30 days as well as the coming months. We'll be glad to answer any initial questions you may have at this time, and we thank you for your time and guidance. Thank you. Any questions for today? Thank you. And our PC rep, Mr. Croft, anything you want to add while you're here? Thank you for coming out today. Thank you for the invitation, and no, I, I think staff summarized it very well. The, the Planning Commission Working Group, all, all eight of them are very engaged in the process, and I think you're going to see some significant uh, enhancements in wording uh, and, and chapter materials, and so I, I think everything is going along very smoothly. Thank you for asking, sir. Thank you, and thank them for all their hard work. And can yes. I just ask, uh, maybe uh, uh, both Mr. Crump and, and staff, uh, are there any areas where we haven't seen a high level of consensus, um, where, where there's really been um, contention or disagreement or lively debate? Well, there's been lively debate. We're in the process of going through the um, future land use map uh, application changes. And um, that, that, that's, uh, we started yesterday, the first discussions and, and votes on that. And, um, you know, there's, there's a trade-off for everything. Uh, one of the takeaways we had from the, the public surveys and the, and the materials that were submitted was that the public is very supportive of preserving the community character, as you see in the rural lands. And part of the process of doing that is to, is to push more development inside the PSA. And of course, the trade-off is in possibly increasing density and, and some other areas. So you know, we're, we're in the process of, of working through that right now. And I think it's going to be very helpful when um, we do the public hearings on those as well uh, in, uh, in June and um, get, get some additional feedback. And I'll turn to staff if there's anything that I neglected to, to mention. Um, there's, there's very much of a, of a desire to make sure that, that the, any gap between um, an item, you know, the importance level to the community and the feeling of what's being done um, in that area, we're looking at that as well. For example, if, if, um, if uh, affordable and workforce housing is rated as a very high priority, but there's a lower percentage that feels we're doing sufficient, uh, taking sufficient measures in that regard. We're trying to address that with the goals, strategies, and actions, and that's a, uh, a continuing process as well. I was going to comment that, uh, so it sounds like you, what you would really like to see from us, uh, if I want to weigh in on some of these things, is to, in the next 30 days to go through, because when I went through this packet, it was, it, that's a huge package. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of information in I don't do well on the screen sometimes, you know, I keep getting white out on it and all that, but, uh, um, but I'm, I, I, I would have like, for example, in some of the land use maps, I might have a recommendation or two on specific uh, uh, applications, you know, and, and I, after I've had a chance to see what the public feedback was and what, mm -hmm. the, what and you're still having that debate going forward, but uh, it's a, you think the next 30 days is the appropriate time for us to get our input to you so that, you know, we uh, we get to weigh in as well about yes, where we think that's going. Uh, yes, and I would think also the same for the goal strategies and actions. There's a lot of material here to go through uh, that, you know, I, 
I looked at that and I said, I don't think I can get everything done to give you <laughs> feedback at the meeting today. But uh, so that outside of the meeting between now and the next 30 days would be a good time. Yes, sir. Okay. And that's one of the reasons uh, because you're exactly right. There's such a huge volume of material. Um, and this is probably the most intense. This is my third comprehensive plan that I've been involved in since I've been on the Planning Commission. And the, the volume of materials, the um, contributions from the two consultant teams, the idea of computer modeling and uh, being able to, to keep the model um, when, the, when this process is, is wrapped up. All of that has, has been very impressive and I think a very complete effort, but to your point, there's a, why, there's a large volume of material to wade through. And I see Mr. Holt is going to add to that as well. I'm just going to supplement, um, <laughs> certainly as well. So um, in terms of the future land use map and the land use policies and the land use applications, we're going to get that packaged up for you. That's going to come to you as part of the April business meeting. So that's still to come. So what we've included so far have been the substantive updates to the individual chapters. And as always, Ellen just did a fantastic job in her cover memo if you, if you want to boil all that 99 pages down to three, uh, her cover member does an excellent job providing the board with highlights of the substantive new policy. PC Working Group has done an inordinately terrific job going through and really wordsmithing every one very deliberately uh, of those GSAs to, to ensure that what's in the plan is reflective of public input to date. So most of what you're going to see in the GSAs is wordsmithing. Certainly want to get your feedback on all of that. But if you need to just sort of start somewhere, I would recommend starting with those three pages of Ellen's cover memo because on each one of those, she's broken it out by chapter, highlights the new policy direction. And so that, that could give you a really good place to start. But, you know, certainly as we move forward, we want to know, I think the PC Working Group, their, their recommendation and, and their finding is um, that the draft documents to date, I, I think, not to speak on their behalf, uh, they think are doing a really good job balancing out amongst all of the chapters, all of the public input received to date. Um, but certainly as we move through, if there are things that are missing, um, please let us know. I think. PC Working Group has very, been very deliberate about taking the input we last received from the board at that last October work session, making sure that it got incorporated. If you still see any missing gaps, you know, let us know. We've got these next couple of months to get these wrapped in. Um, Mr. McGlennon, to your earlier point, there's, there's just been part of the detail and part of the effort and part of the hours and hours and hours that the PC Working Group uh, has, has put into this is to ensure that they're doing a very fair job at, at trying to advance the county's vision to better reflect the input received to date. So I think that's why there's so much volume, because they're doing such a great job incorporating that into the document that we presented. I can just add that it, it really has been a, a team effort on the part of the, the staff has been incredible. The consultants have been very responsive and uh, to uh, a number of requests for data and, and other information. And my colleagues on the working group, um, as I said at the beginning, they just are taking this. They're very engaged and they want to make sure that this comprehensive plan is as good as it can possibly be uh, to make recommendations for where the county should go and to take citizen input into consideration. Okay. Thank you Thank all. you. Thank you. All right, we'll move into D. Board discussion. Any more discussions we want to go over? There's nothing in set. It's, uh, okay, yeah. And then we'll go back we we'll further for um, board requests and directives further in the meeting. So if you want to, okay. All right, we'll move into consent calendars. Consent calendar consists of five items. Number one being minutes adoption. Number two being contract award replacement of the fire boat. Number three being budget appropriation for addressing and bicycle accommodation construction and maintenance funds, Rochambeau Solar Project, 324,000. Uh, number four, budget appropriations for the Proffers Transportation Fund, 11,902. And number five, 2021 scattered site home rehabilitation community development block grant application. 
Are there any items anyone wishes to pull? And if there are, would they let me know now? Mr. Chair, could I please pull number five for a few questions for Mr. Holt? I think that's the housing rehab. Okay. Any others anyone wish to pull? I have a motion on accepting the other the four. consent calendar. All right. Mr. Stevens, would you call the roll, please, sir? Yes, sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Ribble? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Ms. Sadler, number five is all <laughs> Thank yours. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Mr. Holt. I appreciate your help. Um, thanks for the short notice. I got a few con phone calls from some citizens today, so I'd just like to get their questions answered, if I might. Um, first of all, with the homes... Um, that are up for rehab, wh who identifies these homes? Do, do citizens apply for it? Does staff identify them? How does that work? So this, the starting point is the county's waiting list. We have a number of citizens who have reached out to our housing division, which is located as part of our Department of Social Services, and have expressed a need. Um, and so... Um, you know, as you can expect, there's always more need than there are available resources. But since those families have reached out and are on the waiting list, we, we start from there and go down okay. that list. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah. And then would you please explain the criteria for the re residents remaining in the homes for a certain period of time? I believe there's a requirement for, is it five years, I believe? Um, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, answer that question by flipping around a little bit. There's no requirement. For, for homes that we improve, there is no requirement for the family to stay in the home. What protects the county's investment in those properties is a lien on the property for the local dollars. And um, as part of each family, each family is unique um, in terms of their income coming in and their expenses. Part of the process is staff from the housing division sitting down with those families and doing a very detailed budget review, both in terms of, of income history, current income and expenses, and determining a level with which they are able to contribute back and sort of pay the local share back. Every family's different, so some families pay less, some families pay more, and their ability to pay is then translated into, again, the local dollars that are invested in that property translate to a lien on the property. And so because every property is different, some liens could be five years, some liens could stretch out to 30 if they're able to pay less. But that way, in case a family moves out of the home um, or uh, then, then that lien is in place and that's what protects the local investment to make sure we get those dollars back that we can then turn and put into another project next. Okay. And, and of the homes that have been rehabbed in James City County, have there been any that have been done more than once that you're aware of? Um, you know, over the life of the program, um, you know, the, the, the housing program ha has a really successful history of, of probably at least 20 years, if not more. I'm sure somewhere in there um, we've had to go back and um, – relook at some of the properties. I guess with that thought, um, one of the questions that was asked of me is um, when you're looking at income qualifications for residents, um, how do you factor in the, um, the increased um, insurance that will be there, um, the increased value on the property resulting in higher taxes. How do you, is that factored in to? That is, that's all part of that initial review when we okay. look at the income and their expenses and, you know, really looking at the specifics of, of the family and the family composition. Most all of the families that we work with are seniors. Most all of the families that we work with have, have a disability. Um, very many of the families that we work with are multi-generational, so with grandparents and grandkids uh, in the family. And so the, the household income is taken into account. Uh, so in sure. terms of um, a short-term short fix versus a long-term yeah. solution, that would play into that in your, in your, um, uh, it, it with would. your policy with this? So that I guess if you're separating the hard issue of this versus the taxpayer's um, mm -hmm. concerns, um, separating that out long-term, how it affects the county and the taxpayers as well. Every bit. 
So, so to answer your question, I, I, I want to tag on another piece to your earlier question. Certainly, that ability to repay and, and, and part of looking at the family's expenses is ensuring that as part of the, as part of the, the rehabilitation, as, as part of the, re, the repayment, part of the, the, the ability to repay the, the local contribution and the local investment in those properties, it's very important that we set that rate to ensure that that house doesn't become cost burdened. And that's that, that's that point where the house's, household is paying more than 30% of their income every month towards housing. You heard that term come up a whole lot uh, within, within the work that the Workforce Housing Task Force did. Um, you know, for this grant specifically and for the grant that we're currently working on, um, you know, I think what we've, what we've found is, and what an important distinction of this project and this grant funding, this isn't, this isn't um, renovation of a home. This isn't going in and doing regular maintenance and fixing gutters and putting in carpet. These, these programs are designed to address just the very structural nature and the dilapidated structure of the homes. We're going in and fixing rotten floor joists where folks are legitimately afraid they're going to wake up in the morning and fall through the floor and existing holes in the floor and bathrooms that do not work and kitchens that do not have a potable safe water source or our sewer pipes that kind of became unconnected to the main system a while ago and they weren't quite sure how to get it fixed and holes in the roof. I mean, these, these are structural issues. And so the, the, the program that we want to continue and go after this new grant funding, again, is an attempt to provide some solutions to fix those homes that are the most severely distressed. And, and again, severely distressed means you don't need a coat of paint. You've got to go in and fix the structural nature. And but for some of this funding, again, these are most of the families that we work with are earning at or below 50% of area median income. Um, the homes aren't very far off at all from needing to be declared an unsafe structure and uninhabitable. And at that point, there's just not a lot of other options. You don't want for that family to not become homeless. Um, and so at that point, if the home does become such a, such so structurally deficient, um, again, they're going to turn back to social services to see what other forms of, of assistance may be needed because we have to ensure these families have safe and decent housing. Um, this is a scattered site, so th these opportunities are, are, I think it's important to note too, are spread throughout the county. They're not concentrated on any one street or any one neighborhood. Um, but again, we're, we're trying to fix some of the most severely, the, the structurally deficient homes uh, to keep them from falling in on themselves. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. I'm sure, sure. the residents who uh, called me appreciate that explanation as well. And with that, Mr. Chair, I uh, make a motion to approve. Okay. Thank you. And motion for Thank approval. you, Mr. Hall. Roll call, sir. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Moving into board considerations. Number one is contract award administration of the Four seven or four five seven B and the four zero one A retirement plan. Patrick T. Ms. T. How do you do, sir? Good afternoon, Chair, Good afternoon. members of the board. A request for proposal was solicited from qualified carriers and offers to provide comprehensive full service management of our four fifty seven B and four zero one A retirement plans on behalf of eligible employees for James City County. Eight firms responded, describing their ability to provide the management, their experience, references, quality, and cost of their plan services, and the quality of the investment options, and overall quality of the firm's proposal demonstrating the understanding of our county's needs. The contract has an initial term of five years with the option one-year renewals after, and staff recommends approval of the attached resolution to contract to empower retirement. We anticipate savings in both administrative and investment fees, which are currently charged to the employee's account. And we also will have a much wider options of investment choices through the contract. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. 
questions? Questions, very good. No questions. Thank you. All right, we'll look for a motion. Motion to approve. <laughs> Right. Got several motions on the roll call, please, Mr. Stevens. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. No, number two, clarification of acceptance of a deed of easement at 2822 Ford Road. Mr. Zero. How you doing, Tammy? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On June 11, 2019, the Board of Supervisors adopted a resolution amending an offer to amend an existing conservation easement on 2511 and 2611 Forge Road, also known as the Hall Temple Properties. This resolution was clarified and amended by the board on September 10, 2019 to allow for seven residences in exchange for the establishment of a conservation easement on 2822 Forge Road, also known as the Meadows Farm. This easement was to conform to the county's standard conservation easement language and limit residential development to no more than three residential lots, with no structure being closer than 800 feet from the edge of Forge Road. In reviewing the draft language for the conservation easement and related subdivision plat, it has come to staff's attention that the owner's intention, as expressed in materials submitted to the board in June 2019, was to set residential structures back 800 feet from Forge Road, but allow a limited amount of agricultural structures as close as 400 feet to Forge Road. The staff memo made this distinction, but the resulting resolution did not and noted a blanket 800 foot setback. As shown on the exhibit, the applicant has further clarified their request as two 864 square foot horse run ins flanking each side of the front lot of Meadows Farm, oriented with the shortest sides facing Forge Road and set back 500 feet from the center line of the road. These horse run-ins would protect the horses in the adjoining pastures from sun, wind, and rain. In staff's opinion, these would be consistent with the original intention of the property owners, similar situations on conserved properties, and the county's um, agricultural and scenic views of the Meadows Farm and Forge Road. Also shown on the exhibit are other specific easement items for which the property owners have sought pre-approval from the county. First, tall landscaping aligning the central driveway, clustered in corners of the pastures and in a potential 30-foot front yard area. And second, six-foot privacy fencing around the backyard of the residents for parcel one. Staff is of the opinion that this limited landscaping and privacy fencing will not unduly obstruct views of the property and the adjoining open land. More details regarding how these issues would be handled were provided in the memo. With confirmation from the board, staff will continue to finalize these and other terms in the easement. In conclusion, staff has no objection to the clarification allowing a limited amount of agricultural structures within the 500 to 800 foot setback in the Meadows Farm and recommends that the board adopt the attached resolution clarifying that two horse shelters of a maximum of 875 foot square foot each may be established on the Meadows Farm. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. In addition, Mr. Holly Smith is present and will be making some remarks as the applicant. Any questions? None at this time? All right, thank you. Mr. Smith, how you doing, sir? Welcome. Well, Mr. Chair and to the board, um, first just wanted to say that I appreciate your and staff's time on this item. Um, I want to thank you for your service just to James City County and to its residents um, and specifically to this project. Uh, I want to thank you for your patience uh, and working with us. Uh, staff has done a great job and specifically uh, Tammy and Adam have spent a lot of time with us um, and thank you to both of you as well um, to have gone above and beyond to be sure that this project is done well for the sake of the county and the residents of Forge Road also. As a tribe alum and former pastor at the Williamsburg Community Chapel, I do love Williamsburg and James City County and we're excited to get underway and uphold our commitment to delivering a great product for the future residents out on Forge Road. Um, I'm available for any questions that you have regarding the uh, amendment, thank you. Questions? 
all we're talking about basically on this is the um, is, is moving or, or allowing the, the two extra run-ins in order to serve the horses so they have a protection into the 800 foot, but no further than 500 foot off the road, which um, as, as everybody knows, I'm, I'm very protective of Forge Road and, and everything that goes on down in Forge Road. I think it's one of the prettier roads we have in the county, not that we don't have a lot of other pretty roads in the county. It's just one that I enjoy so much. And um, I think that, you know, the, the, the way the, the Forge Road is set up there, the, the run-ins are, are um, you know, match with everything that goes, that's in that area and, and how they serves our communities. So I, don't, I don't have any issues, but I would look for the board for a motion for approval or any other discussion anyone may have. Motion. Move the motion. All right. Mr. Stevens, will you call the roll, sir, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Moving into number three of Virginia Land Conservancy Foundation, uh, Grant Grove. Ms. Brittle. Good afternoon, Welcome. members of the board. Um, what you have before you today is um, a memo and a resolution seeking permission to apply for a matching grant from the Virginia Land Conservation Foundation. Um, for a 50-50 um, matching grant to assist with the acquisition of 7.75 acres of property in the Grove community. The purchase of the property will allow for the creation of a community park to support identified citizen needs in the lower end of James City County. If funds are awarded, the county will be required to include language in the recorded deed that states the property will be placed under restrictions of the Open Space Land Act of Virginia and the protection is in perpetuity. Um, staff recommends support of the attached resolution, um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you about the grant process. Questions? All right. Chairman, I'll move the resolution in approving the uh, application. Thank you, sir. All right. We have a motion. Roll, please, Mr. Stevens. Sir, Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, board requests and directives. Yes, ma'am. All right. You can respond. We have an award. Our economic development office has done an amazing job with the, um, I'll just read you this little presentation here. Last week, the Virginia Economic Developers Association, or VEDA as it's commonly known, recognized their 2021 recipients of the VEDA Community Economic Development Awards. These awards recognize exceptional contributions of communities in the Commonwealth of Virginia for the following efforts, business retention and expansion, business recruitment, community development, community involvement. I'm pleased to announce that the James City County Office of Economic Development received the award in the 40,000 to 100,000 resident population category. The award was for our business retention and community involvement efforts, establishing a partnership with the Greater Williamsburg Partnership, Williamsburg Community Foundation, and the Virginia 30-Day Fund to be the first locality partnership offering $3,000 forgivable loans to James City County businesses. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the board for their support for this program with the allocation of funds. We were able to support more than 125 of our small businesses, helping them to retain their employees and keep their doors open for business. Thank you to staff for your diligent efforts in supporting this initiative and for being the first locality to do so. So Mr. Stevens, I would love for you to take this lovely award to Mr. Johnson's office. It's well-deserved. And thank him so much. I don't see him here, but we appreciate everything that they've done. Thank you. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful. Yay. Well done. Speech. <laughs> That's it. Oh. That's it? Yeah, I'm going to end on a good note. Okay. Um, I, just to recap the last uh, couple of a uh, couple of weeks, I've had uh, on March 10th an uh, interview with WMBG, and uh, Brian uh, did comment on how nice it was to have our chairman back uh, on the interview schedule. So uh, thank, thank you. you for being there as well. Um, on March 17th, uh, 
Chairman Hibble and I have participated with the uh, retaining wall working group of uh, folks who expressed interest in, in looking at that. I think we had a really good productive meeting. Staff is now working on some information and, and we'll get a follow up uh, back to the board uh, on how to maybe uh, tweak that. Um, March 18th, business council restructuring. One of the things that's going on, and, and uh, uh, Ms. Larson is, uh, and on the tourism side has do, uh, been doing this as well. Uh, they are essentially restructuring to eliminate, if you will, the overarching board from the tourism uh, uh, council, I mean, from the uh, Chamber of Commerce. So what will happen uh, if this all goes through is that the funding for the money will go directly to the two agencies, whereas in the past it's sort of gone to the central coffers and then been parsed out to the two, two different organizations. So uh, and with the independence of the Tourism Council uh, being uh, pretty strongly uh, reinforced, I think this will be a great, great help. And it will actually eliminate a little bit of the uh, uh, overhead that we have and I think simplify their, their process. So that's in the process. It'll, hopefully that will be completed with all their bylaws, everything done by the uh, end of the fiscal year. Uh, the little uh, photo that we have, if we can put that up, uh, we got it on the board for now, but uh, hopefully our folks at home can see this. Uh, the uh, ironbound crosswalk that I had mentioned earlier, uh, I had a lot of constituents in the, uh, the meadows and a lot of children live in that community. And of course, ironbound road is a pretty busily traveled road and Kidsburg is across the street. So kids getting from one community to the, the playground over there was always a concern. The only crosswalk we had, they had to go all the way up to the, the corner uh, by uh, where News Road uh, turns onto Ironbound there. Um, and uh, this was finally completed. Uh, we have a very nice crosswalk away there. And I got a very nice email, and it was also put on Facebook, from the Ostat family. And uh, this is Cassidy. She, uh, she wrote me a very nice little card, and if you can't read it, it says, thank you for putting me in the crosswalk. Now I'm not scared of getting hit by a car anymore. Thank you. So I, I really, really appreciated that uh, feedback. Uh, it's one of the benefits of being able to do something nice for the community occasionally. Not, not a, at least that maybe offsets every time we have to deal with taxes. <laughs> uh, the last thing I would like to uh, uh, bring up is uh, March 29th is the uh, uh, Vietnam War Veterans uh, Day. And that was... Uh, set up in uh, 2017 by, fe by federal legislation. Um, it uh, commemorates March the 29th of 1973, which was the date on which the Military Assistance Command in Vietnam was disbanded, the last combat troops left the country, and uh, the last prisoners of war returned to the United States. Uh, so please keep, on the March the 29th, please keep the Vietnam veterans in your, in your thoughts. Uh, one of the facts that I found today in looking at it was we have about 85,000 Vietnam, Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam War veterans still in the country. That's only about 31% of them. So we're, we're a, a vanishing species, and uh, the youngest is about age 60, so I'm one of the older guys. Is there going to be a, um, an event up at the park? We have, been, we have been, had events, events in the past. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we have not had been able to schedule one. I'm hoping that next year this time we'll be able to have a very Isn't large Isn't it outside? Event. Yeah, but it's, uh, you got to remember, we got we got folks that are very elderly, and some of them some of them still hadn't gotten their shots at the time. So we were just a little bit leery. We're beginning to start having meetings again in the next couple of weeks now that most folks are getting their shots. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, uh, and I think we're going to have a, when we do it again the next time, we're going to have a really big uh, opportunity to have a, a celebration out at uh, Veterans Park. I know the Parks Rec was a very... Uh, is helpful in, in getting it set up. We've had a couple of good ones there before, but uh, yeah, unfortunately this year we're, uh, we'll be lucky if we can make Memorial Day uh, by the time we start getting folks back together again for some of these celebrations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, start with, um, I, I do appreciate Mr. Carroll coming this evening and our, <laughs> today, it's not this evening, and um, discussing everything that VDOT's been doing. And I do want to acknowledge that I have received quite a bit of feedback regarding the um, traffic change that is coming to Route 5 in Centerville. Uh, I hope that people were able to hear that they did model the other intersections that people would be using. They feel they're sufficient. Um, also, that this will be 
uh, something that they will continue to keep an eye on. So if it's not working or it causes another issue, then we'll have to regroup. Um, there is a long-term uh, solution uh, out there, and that's uh, a possible alignment of Centerville and um, Green Springs, a possible um, roundabout, uh, but that, of course, is very costly, and there's not the money for that right now. So, um, you know, when I first got on this board and, and that intersection had been, um, people had been, I, I've said, I said it back then, and I'll say it again today, it is um, the number one thing that people uh, talk to me about. Um, it's, it's gotten quieter because school hasn't been in, I think. So we've, we, and people haven't been going to work every day. But we can see that's changing. Um, you know, schools are gonna go back four days a week. I don't know about high school and middle school, but I know elementary is. People are starting to get back into the office. So we're going to start seeing some of that increased traffic. Um, so, um, but I have heard people, and I am also sorry that that there was such a short notice of such a, it is a big change, I understand. I also turn on that road to go to work. Um, so it is impacting me as well. And um, and I understand the concern, but also knowing the danger at that intersection, we have asked that something be done, something is being done. It may not be a solution that everybody is in favor of, and I understand that but I hope that we will give it a, a, a chance and um, also the speed limit change. So, um, but as always, um, not that anybody needs an invitation, but you're always welcome to reach out to me and, um, I, and I will get back to any email or phone call. Uh, I did wanna talk, oh, and I did wanna say that I agree with, I am out Toano a lot and you are so right about that crossing to that grocery store or the convenience store uh, people are always darting. Sometimes, you know, I, I have a friend who treats us to pizzas on Friday night, so it's been out there. So I'm out there quite a bit. It's, you know, it's hard enough when it's 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the afternoon, 5 o'clock. You can see when you're coming back in the dark, people are still darting um, across that street. It's, it's standing not at very the turn well lane waiting, yeah. Yes, so um, it is definitely a concern, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, we had a tourism council meeting last week. Uh, just, to, just to bring you all up to speed, um, Roger Dow, who is the president and CEO of the U.S. Travel Association, uh, came and gave us, a, <laughs> came virtually, uh, gave us a presentation um, really was optimistic about travel, feeling as, you know, he really feels as though 2022 is going to be the year, but is seeing some pickup for the end of 2021 as well. Uh, so, um, you know, his, his message was to, you know, stay optimistic, um, try to set goals for your community to be vaccinated and to be in a place to accept visitors. We are, of course, accepting visitors um, now, but um, to try to try to be hopeful in your messaging, you know, and 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 so that people would want to come to where um, where you are. Uh, just as an aside, I sent you all an, a note on Sunday and said the outlet mall was packed. There was it was very hard. It was that. Same old, you know, and I wasn't even trying to get too close. I was just trying to get a parking spot. Um, lines in some stores to get into some stores and lots of out of place, out of plate, um, license plates, out of state license plates, excuse me. Um, so I don't know if it just sort of happened to combine with spring break, but I did try to find out some hotel information. I'm hoping to um, see if we have a little uptick in our um, hotel stays this past weekend. So, um, and I know um, that uh, Bush Gardens is hoping to see a little bit um, less restrictions on the people that they can have in, in their park moving forward. Again, safely, they have safety precautions in place. And I know that they were hoping to announce something. The governor was holding a press conference at two today that I believe he was going to do some upping of um, social gatherings to 50 inside 
and uh, a hundred outside. How many? A hundred. A hundred outside. So um, seeing a little bit of a of a bump there. Ms. Larson, do you happen to know if they're still going to require masking for outdoors at Bush Gardens? I don't. He did not say he they didn't have, say. He didn't announce any changes of that type. So I was curious about I would think so. I'm, I'm guessing so until maybe there's we get further down the vaccination. But I, I don't want to speak for Kevin, but he didn't go into that particular piece. So also want to thank um, Ms. Sadler. Let me jump into her jail meeting uh, last week where they were very kind to recognize me um, for my service there. It was good to see everybody there. Um, do want to um, send my sympathies to Randy Wheeler and the, the family of his assistant county administrator that did pass away from COVID. Um, and so our um, deepest sympathies there. And, um, you know, you brought up uh, about the fact that the two of you were on the retaining wall and I had uh, committee and I had reached out to um, Supervisor McGlennon last week because in my supervisor certification classes, a lot of um, boards have committees, budget committees, different committees. And which I, so I sent a note to John and said, do we have those kind of committees? Um, or have we ever had, I know we don't currently, but have we ever had those kind of committees? Um, because I do think where we can, and you know, um, I'm sure there, the, 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 the con is staff probably doesn't want us on every committee. Um, and also the time effort that that we would have to put into it in addition to everything that we else that we that we do um but i do think the pro sometime is that when the two of you come back with your what you've learned at the retaining wall that's going to help the rest of us with that you know we're going to trust you you're our colleague and you're going to bring to us the good information so um i hope that you know maybe in the future there'll be some opportunities for that so um, then this, this is a little, um, this is a little old, but just a couple of weeks, but I thought it was very interesting that the Commonwealth of Virginia is home to more than 108,000 women veterans. And we, and one, one of the largest in the country. So, and also there was a, um, op-ed about regular meetings with citizen participation, a must return. And We've been doing that all along. So, um, you know, we have kept open um, even during COVID. I mean, I know we are, we are um, limited in the number that we have in here, but we don't turn anyone away. They, there's other opportunities to wait and then come in as others leave. So, thank you. Thank you. So, does that mean that, that Jim and I are going to be the uh, retaining wall committee, oh, yeah. the first one. Yeah. I guess you are. You're, in, you're already on it. Right. So, yes. You created it. You're the chairman. <laughs> John, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a, a couple of things. I'll try to be uh, quick about them uh, in, in most instances. A few shout-outs that I just wanted to give. One is to the vaccination clinic that uh, is being run at uh, the uh, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's Visitor Center. Uh, thanks to the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, yes. to our partners out there. Uh, to um, Chief Ash and all of those who have been working uh, with the vaccinations. Uh, I can tell you that there are very few things where I've received so much uniformly positive response from the citizens who've utilized that facility. It has just been uh, something to behold. That people uh, are, are amazed at the efficiency, the um, promptness, the care with which uh, everything is being done. So appreciate that very much. Um, and I also want to uh, appreciate the, our social services department, police, and, and uh, Parks and Rec who are all involved in the Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, that is such an important uh, uh, um, uh, issue for us to highlight. And I know our staff usually does an excellent uh, job of uh, informing the community about it, usually with some kind of a public gathering. I know that it's tough to do that uh, these days, but uh, 
uh, they have put together a wonderful information packet uh, that uh, includes uh, their opportunity to do art and, and uh, um, kids to do artwork uh, uh, in a competition and so forth. So I think that's, that's great. Uh, also wanted to give a shout out to um, Steve Rose, uh, who took some of the proceeds from uh, the Eco Discovery Park that uh, he was uh, operating a while back uh, when uh, citizens voluntarily made contributions to that as it was seeking a, a more permanent uh, place and gave that money to Parks and Rec to install some exercise stations on the Green Springs Trail and Capital Capital Trail. So thanks for that uh, good public spirit uh, donation. We hope to recognize him in the near future as soon as those are installed. Great, great, that yes. would be terrific. Uh, um, just a couple of things uh, um, that uh, uh, we had some discussion about the scattered site housing program, uh, and I've been representing the board on that uh, committee for the, for the last uh, year or so, I guess. Uh, uh, and uh, I can tell you that it is making a real difference in people's lives. And it also brought some wonderful uh, attention to the county um, yesterday with a publication in a national online uh, um, newsletter that goes out every day from Route 50, which I believe is a subsidiary of the Atlantic magazine, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, but it was um, a very, very positive uh, discussion about what one county is doing to address the problem of affordable housing. And so I, I commend that to you. I think we got a uh, um, link sent to us uh, by Marion Payne yesterday uh, from the housing office. Uh, we all attended uh, the joint meeting with the uh, schools and the city council and had an inter interesting discussion there. And then uh, this past week, uh, Ms. Larson, uh, uh, Mr. Stevens and I attended uh, the school liaison meeting where we had further discussions about the pre-K task force uh, and just to let you know that uh, at some point in the process uh, of the next several months, um, there will be regular checkbacks with the school liaison committee, and there will be at least one presentation and, and opportunity for input from the board uh, as, as part of that process, uh, just to, to uh, make sure uh, you're aware of, of that. Uh, I also serve as our representative on the Greater Peninsula um, Workforce uh, uh, Consortium. And as you know, we are merging with the Hampton Roads Workforce Council uh, to become one regional entity, and that uh, process uh, is ongoing and apparently working quite well. And I think uh, it's being recognized nationally as a great effort to improve uh, the um, efficiency and to expand the impact of our Workforce Council. Uh, two final uh, last things I wanted to draw attention to, um, take it just a little bit uh, more. I want to thank the police department uh, for following up on a request that I'd made to uh, try to check in with any um, Asian American owned businesses or uh, businesses that cater to um, Asian Americans uh, in, in our community, just to make sure that they're feeling safe in a time when we're seeing a dramatic increase in attacks on uh, our fellow citizens of Asian heritage, and, and uh, uh, I think we, we really want to send a clear message that we are a welcoming and inclusive community uh, for our residents who happen to have Asian uh, Pacific Island uh, uh, heritage, uh, just as any other citizen, uh, but also uh, for our tourists uh, who are coming from uh, uh, other places in the United States who happen to have Asian uh, heritage, or tourists from Asian nations or Pacific Island locations. So I think it is important for us to uh, recognize that uh, um, we have uh, seen um, a growing concern among Asian Americans nationally, and we want to make sure that our community is aware of that heightened concern and does everything we can to reassure them that uh, we want to value all of our citizens and protect them. Uh, from any uh, untoward events. Finally, I wanted to, uh, to spend a moment just uh, taking note of the passing of one of our county employees. Uh, Nan Burcham uh, worked uh, as a web and publication specialist for James City County for about uh, the last 16 years. Um, and we, we know some things about, about Nan. Uh, um, uh, like many of our county employees, 
Um, she was valued for her caring spirit and uh, her kindness and the fact that she was always willing to share a smile. Uh, she had a deep devotion to her family and uh, a great uh, love for animals. Uh, and some things we don't know as well. And one of the ways in which uh, over the course of those 16 years, she touched all of us on this board is that she was one of the members of the staff who were responsible for putting together our board packets for every meeting for, the, for that time period. She would do the proofreading, she would work on formatting, she would make sure that everything was uh, ready to go for us to be able to gather the information that we needed to make important decisions. Uh, Nan's family had connections to James City County in, in a lot of ways. Uh, um, her son, Kyle, was an intern for our planning department uh, and actually did some work with uh, Mr. Kinsman as well on some legal issues. Uh, he is now, he, is, he went on to law school and is now a practicing attorney here in town. Uh, her, her brother, Jeff Alines, was one of our police officers. And so uh, it is truly the case that, uh, that Nan uh, was part of the, William, of the James City County family uh, in, in many ways, and she passed away at the end of February and just wanted to uh, bring attention to her passing and to uh, express to her husband Jeff and her son Kyle, the rest of her family, uh, our deep sympathy and appreciation for all that she brought to James City County. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. I a few things. Jim talked about the retaining wall, and, and now that we're on the committee, we're going to be the first. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank um, Sue and Ruth both for your work on, on your traffic issues. I know y'all both been working on it very hard, and, and I think, Ruth, you were a little ahead of the schedule from <laughs> Sue for working a few more days on it, and um, it just shows the dedication of what this board has for their community and how hard y'all worked on it. And there might be a solution, there may not be a solution. Well, we can do this, we can do that. And, and regardless of how much time you've put into it and how many meetings you've had and how many meetings with the public you've had, there'll always be someone who didn't think you did enough. But I know y'all have, and, and we've seen it firsthand. So I just want to, you know, the, the comments you may get that are negative, there's a lot of positive that never say anything. So and a, lot of, a lot of people that you may save lives from, from the changes you've done. So I just want to say great job and keep up the good work. Um, HR Tech, we had a um, good meeting with HR Tech and, and Finance Committee and everything. And in fact, we finally brought our director up in, uh, um, to the wage that he should be making. And um, the Finance Committee and HR Tech unanimously brought him up to the, to the point where he should be. And I'm, I'm proud of that because he does such a wonderful job <clears throat> for us, for the community, and to save us money like you wouldn't believe. He's always looking for money and, and trying to find out some. And as finance director, I work very close with him. And he'll even say, I'm not bringing you anything today to approve because there's a pair of boots in this financial record that are not supposed to be that we shouldn't be paying for. And so if he can find when you're dealing with 38 or 200 million and a, and a request and you find a pair of boots in there, you're looking pretty close about, you know, watching our money and what we need in our, in our area. So hats off to um, Kevin Page for that. Harumpha, we had a great meeting in Harumpha. I'm chair of the Harumpha committee and um, great meeting there. And, and they're working very hard. We got, we got our budget out early. I had suggested years ago that, that we get our budget out to our communities earlier than later. We always got our budget request out after the budgets were being put together in the counties and cities. I said, let's move it up forward and get our ask out up front. And then that way the communities know what we're looking for there. Um, I still have a few concerns about our budget there. We carry a very large um, cash revenue that I don't think we need to carry, but I'm working on that with them slowly, but hopefully surely. Um, trash cleanup, you know, um, Ruth, you mentioned it the other day of the, the litter and all of us see it. I'm so sick and tired of the litter. I could scream. I don't don't know how. And and I'm I I was riding around with a client the other day, 
and they were looking for a house in James City County to build. They want to build a house here in James County, anywhere in James City County or Williamsburg, but want to live within this area. And as we're riding around, they said, you know, y'all have just as much litter here as we have at home. And that's terrible to hear. You know, and they said, you know, and, and, they said, and, and I was told that their sister lives in Colorado. And they said, there's no trash there. I said, can you find out what they're doing? Is it the citizens care so much about the community they don't throw the trash out? And so it bugged me so much just to hear that from someone outside the community. You know, we know there's there's huge amount of trash problems. Peg tells us all the time, bless her heart, and all the hard work her and her team does and county staff to keep it cleaned up. But I was talking to Mr. Stevens, and <clears throat> excuse me, during his report, he may be in it tell us a little bit about it, but we talked about options. You know, if we're going to throw the trash out, maybe then we take money out of the budget to clean the trash up. Because by telling everybody and, and insisting that you do it and educating them and putting out things and doing, it hadn't changed. In fact, it's gotten worse. So, you know, if you want to throw trash out, then you should be have to pay in order to make our community better. And we talked about options of, of um, um, the jail, partner with them, maybe have two shifts, five to seven days a week out in our community. Talked about, okay, what if we hire somebody, hire several people with a truck and a trailer to do nothing but pick up trash. And um, because, you know, if I'm coming here to visit, I want to ride down the road and see a clean road. And Rossi said it, and I saw his people out there the other day on the secondary roads picking up trash. And from one end, as you're riding down that road and you see all the litter, and then you get a little bit further up the road where they've already picked up and how clean it is, it's like refreshing. I mean, and we should not have to live in a pigsty. I'm totally against trash on it. And I know when somebody's going to the road and something blows out of their truck, they may not know what's in there and may not mean for it to blow out. They may not have seen it blow out, but you can't monitor. Our police force would have to drive behind every truck out there. Oh, there's one, you know, and, and there's no way we could do it. It's just impossible. So I think the only thing we can do is go, you know what? We'll keep our litter cleaning going. We'll keep, you know, all our volunteers going and everything else, but we may have to supplant money into that in order to have a, a crew that does picking up trash or the um, the jail allowing us <laughs> a few more um, pickups and maybe that would help. But um, Mr. Stevens, if you have anything on that to add, that'd be great. But I'm going to turn it over to you now for your report, sir. Uh, Chairman Hibble, I had a couple items. I, I do think your discussion on trash would be a good part of our budget discussion of where we fit that in. And, and I really agree. I think it takes a, a continuing effort. You're doing some now to supplement VDOT's pickups. It just doesn't seem to be enough to keep up, unfortunately. And so whether those are staff from, from our side that we employ, whether it's leveraging uh, some of our inmate resources and funding uh, their staff person to be their supervisor for a crew of inmates, uh, there's also some movement about some additional community service workers, and maybe it's an opportunity for us to have more people out picking up. But I do think, to your point, if you don't do more to pick it up, it's going to continue to be problematic. We, the education piece is important. The volunteers are important. Uh, but there's just a high trash load right now along many communities, ours included. So I do agree with the idea that we need to do more. Uh, I do have a few other things that I wanted to share with the board and, and the community. Uh, just a vaccination update. We've talked about this several weeks. Uh, I will say as of last week, there's nearly 2.9 million COVID vaccinations that have been administered in Virginia. So we are making progress. Uh, as we started into this, Virginia was receiving approximately 1,000 doses per, 100,000 doses per week. As of last week, we're up to over 500,000 doses per week. Some of those the state controls, some of those are going directly to some of the larger retail pharmacies. But we are making progress in that area. And we're told the best way to find the retail pharmacies is to go to vaccinefinder.org, that website, vaccinefinder.org. And you can search by location, and it will show you those other locations outside of your doctor's offices or the state health department clinics that are being run in terms of where you might be able to sign up for a vaccination. The, Divin the Virginia Department of Health announced that some local health districts will begin moving into phase 1C and that it is likely all health districts will move to 1C 
by mid-April. The Peninsula Health District, our district, is not in 1C yet, but the expectation is sometime in April we would move to 1C and open up vaccinations to a larger group. And I would, we are still encouraging people to register with the Virginia Department of Health website in terms of getting an appointment or to call their 877 number, 829-4682, uh, if you need help in registering on their website. Within James City County, the Health Department website showed as of yesterday, 42,000 doses had been administered and 16,000 people were fully vaccinated. Our clinic at the Colonial Williamsburg Visitor Center uh, operations have gone very well. We vaccinated 1,000 individuals last week, another 1,100 plus are scheduled for this week. And since opening our clinic, we've provided over 11,500 doses uh, at our clinic alone. So we've at least had a significant part of those 42,000 people that have received a vaccine here in James City. We're still in phase 1B. Now, again, that's 65 years and older and essential workers, and, we'll continue, and we are continuing to work off the VDH registration list uh, that has been provided to us. So where we were sending people to be registered there, that is where the, the invitations for our clinic are coming from, is that list that people registered for beginning back in December. Uh, we have made some good progress in reaching out to some of our underserved communities, and we do have a, a partnership with Centera coming in the coming weeks that so will open that up to a thousand more uh, vaccinations for some of those underserved communities and has used local pastors and some of our volunteer and civic organizations to reach into those groups. And so that's been very uh, beneficial and positive for our community. Last week, we announced a regional health care uh, that our regional health care community has joined to create Operation Vaccinate the Peninsula. It's still a collaboration across local health districts, localities, and the health systems on the peninsula. And the organizations within this alliance will be operating under a unified command structure to facilitate cohesive COVID-19 vaccination planning, execution, resource allocation, and communication. We're still putting all that together and pulling our subgroups, but thus far that is working, we believe, very well. We are making progress towards vaccinating our community. The governor's press conference today, as Ms. Larson alluded to, is at least relaxing some of the restrictions. We're not out of the woods yet, but we are better than we were six months ago. We're all continue to, to hit, continue to ask ourselves and residents to keep washing and sanitizing our hands, uh, social distancing, and wearing our mask. And Ms. Sadler, I think there'll be more direction coming, but at this point, we're still asked to do all those things we've been doing for the past nine months or more in terms of looking after each other. Um, and I think that's enough on vaccinations. So I'll move on to some staffing updates just to keep uh, you up to date of where we are. First, I'm moving forward with filling our uh, chief of police uh, position with an internal process. Uh, we have a number of candidates that I believe, based on their training, education, and experience, make them ideal applicants for this position. So Brad Heim Reinheimer, our former police chief, will be working to develop our assessment process, which will inc include some community members. And my hope is that we'll be able to make a permanent appointment to this position by June timeframe. In addition to that, as a way to broaden some individual experience and strengthen the organization, I've made a temporary change as we have done in years past, maybe many years ago, where we would swap some of our executive or leadership team and change in duties for two of my senior staff members. Jason Purse, my assistant county administrator, is temporarily assigned as our interim parks and recreation director, and John Carnifax, our parks and recreation director, is temporarily assigned as our interim assistant county administrator. Both of these have been in these roles for approximately two weeks. Uh, at thus, thus far, they're working well. They've had some new experiences. Uh, this temporary assignment goes until August, so I look forward to having Jason back in the room with you on a more regular basis in August. I believe he was around some today, and John moving him back out to Parks and Rec come the August time frame. But I think those are good changes for our organization. And finally, uh, the, my proposed FY22 budget will be released, released on Friday of this week, so the 26th. We have a public meeting scheduled for March 30th at 2 p.m. here in the boardroom in Building F. The meeting will allow limited in-person attendance, similar to what we've done with your board meetings for the past 12 months with having limited numbers allowed in the boardroom and remote participation by anyone that's interested via Facebook. And for those that just want to watch and listen, it will be available for viewing on channels 48 or 1048, depending on your system at home. We do have a budget public hearing scheduled for your April 13th board meeting at 5 o'clock and a board discussion uh, with the Board of Supervisors at your business meeting on April 27th. And then we hope for an adoption of the budget or FY22 budget on May 11th. So more budget discussion in the coming month to include uh, trash and cleanup and how we make things look better around James City County. So, I'm sorry, what time was that public hearing again? Uh, the public meeting will be March 30th at 2 o'clock 
here in boardroom and will be uh, streamed on Facebook as well as limited in-person attendance. If we want to, as as board members, if we want to attend, is there? A, uh, do we have to uh, announce a uh, formal meeting if three of us uh, attend, as long as we're just sitting in to observe? Or, you know, we can accommodate that, but we can take care of that working with Teresa and Adam. If, if it doesn't do require, I mean, if, we, if we're, you know, not to, to participate, but just to sit and observe and, and to see the, the public uh, feedback, uh, it would be it would be uh, helpful. I just want to make sure we had that ability for. More we'll than make sure you have that ability to be here and be be okay if you choose to do that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have, unless there are other questions or comments. Questions, comments? All right, next I'll look for a motion to go into closed session for consideration of acquisition of a purchase of development right easements on property along Cranston's Mill Pond Road, pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A3 of the Code of Virginia. So moved. So moved. All right, Mr. Stevens, roll please, sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries.
session. Need a certification. Mr. Chairman, I move that we certify that we only spoke about those items we indicated we would discuss in the closed meeting. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, would you call the roll, please, sir? Yes, sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Excuse Aye. me, Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. Move that we adjourn until uh, 5, PM. 5 p.m. on April 13th. 13th. Yeah. For our regular meeting. Yeah. All right, we have a motion. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. We're adjourned.